all know where the toilets are and the housekeeping arrangements. If there's a fire, we'll follow John. All right. Do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, Chair. I've had apologies from Councillors Mike Levery with Councillor Richard Shaw subbing and Zahira Naz with Councillor Diane Hurst subbing. Thank you, John. For uh, the purposes of the camera, I think, can we all see people's um, name tags? And then we don't have to go through uh, introducing ourselves. Okay, thank you. Do we have any exclusion of public and press? No, thank you. Item four, any declarations of interest, members? Thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm just, I would just like to introduce Ruth in the corner. Ruth Mersero would just like to indicate. Ruth is just uh, observing today as um, Councillor Douglas uh, Johnson's assistant. Okay. Minutes of the previous meeting. I take it that you've all read them. Do we, can we agree them to be a true record? Before we go through, thank you. Yes, agreed. Thank you. Do we have any matters arising from the minutes? On page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five, page six, page seven. Okay, we're all happy for me to sign them off as a true record and no matters arising. Thank you very much, members. Now, we have uh, numerous people with public questions today. Uh, do we have any petitions? No petitions, Chair. Okay, um, can somebody, uh, there is not a screen that people can't, uh, what room is it? Reception? The reception room, yeah. yeah. the questioners are in reception. I think they're all just waiting for us to start. Right, okay. We'll get that rectified. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. We've got quite a lot of people waiting to ask questions today, so um, and we have to bring them in one at a time because of COVID restrictions. So we have got somebody on hand that's going to be helping us, so it might speed it up a little bit. Um, we haven't, unfortunately, got all the questions from the questioners, so um, we've asked them to fill in some forms like they do in the... Uh, for the full council, and we'll wait for the first one to come along. Um, a question to the staff for the student. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, Deborah is going to read some out that's not going to be attending today. And um, these can be done by written, we can do written responses to these questions uh, that are going to be written out, read out by Deborah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, okay, so the first question is from Liz Allen, who is a resident, and she says um, she is very concerned about any plan to restore motor traffic to this route, whilst the temporary measures. Sorry. Apologise. Just press the wrong button. <laughs> Whilst the temporary measures, particularly at the Leopold Street end, are visually unappealing and have created access issues, the solution to this is to replace these measures as quickly as possible with the City Centre Transforming Cities Fund scheme, which will deliver benefits for people walking and cycling along with public transport users and delivering much needed public realm improvements. The consultation for this was completed in January and the majority of responses were positive. I do not believe this scheme can be delivered if motor traffic is restored along this route and that therefore this significant funding will be lost. 
If this is the case, I would be worried about the impact of the on the viability of other TCF schemes, as well as some of the active travel fund schemes, which all link into the city centre. It is important to note that the TCF schemes are not just um, aimed at cyclists, but deliver vital improvements for walking and public transport, which are badly needed in Sheffield, to give people viable alternatives to making their journeys by car. I would also be concerned about the impact of this decision on future uh, Department for Transport funding for all transport schemes in Sheffield. The question is, please could you respond to these comments from Cycle Sheffield? So the words that I read out were from Cycle Sheffield and Liz would like a response to those comments. Thank you, Deborah. I think uh, we'll get officers to respond in writing to that, to Cycle Sheffield. Thank you. The um, next one. The second one is another... Um, yeah. Councillor Rooney. Sorry to be pedantic, but does the questioner want an answer from either the cabinet member or officers or from this committee? Because they might be different. Right. Well, because we've got lots of questions today and some of them are replicated, and I think that that is one of them, we've decided just to read out some so we can get through all of them. That, that's the decision. However, those questions, if, you, if you've, I've read some of the other questions, that is going to be uh, asked by others that are coming in. So when they come in, we can um, ask who they'd like to answer. <laughs> okay. But having said that, it would be a good idea, I think, if they got an answer from perhaps a politician and from the officers, if that's okay. Oh. Okay. Sorry, I was just saying, happy to answer now, happy to ask the officers to answer now, or we can do something in writing. I mean, it, it is you know, the main topic of debate today, isn't it? Um, so we, we can start off with addressing that at the outset. Um, probably you'd say in your hands as chair. Chair, if, if I make a suggestion, a lot of these questions are going to be answered because they'll be going through the debate as we're going on there. So the, the, if members of the public are watching or, or viewing this afterwards, then they may be answered out there. So we won't necessarily need a written answer because the, the meetings will discuss this and we'll probably get answers that come out throughout the debate in there because some of the questions that are being asked are no doubt the questions that colleagues sat around this room will be asking as well. So rather than Councillor, uh, Councillor Johnson or, or Tom Pinkin smith answering now, it, it, it seems a bit spiritless to do it when we may as well get the answers as part of the debate. Thank you, Councillor Lodge. I was just doing this to speed up the process because we've got quite a lot of questioners out there that's going to be repeating what's been said. So we'll, we'll carry on just reading out the questions. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks, Chair. Um, if I could just add uh, to your comments then as well in response to uh, Councillor Rooney, if the committee's take on this at the end of the discussion is different to the cabinet members, sorry, the executive members and the officers, then there's no reason why the committee can't make a decision to respond accordingly. Okay, uh, so the second question um, from a member of the public from Emily Griffiths is, in examining best use of, of the public realm in a city that has declared a climate emergency and where efficiency can be measured in terms of space taken up, energy expended or how many people are using it, how efficient is the transport mix of Pinstone Street now and how efficient was it with two-way motor traffic? Do you want me to carry on, Chair? Yes, please. Um, the rest of the questions are all members of the public who want to ask the questions in person. I've got no others to read Thank out. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if Philippa wants to bring the first questionnaire in.
sorry about this, members. We're just waiting for the first question. Thank you. Would you like to just introduce yourself and ask a question? I would. Thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Sefton, and I chair the Residents Association for the city centre called changingchef.org. And we are appalled to know that the council is contemplating the return of traffic to Pinstone Street. Now, coincidentally, I've got some leaflets here about a seminar that we're organising on the 28th of this month, and I can leave them so that you can pick one up if you wish, about the future of the city centre. The, the heading is, how should Sheffield city centre develop in the next five years? So that shows that we're really interested in what happens with our city centre. My question is to ask if we can be told whether the council has asked for the views of Dame Sarah's story over this proposal. And if it has, what are her views? In her position as the Active Travel Commissioner for the Sheffield City Region and a person with disability who has a remarkable record of winning 17 Paralympic gold medals, we might presume that she feels the same way as the city centre residents do, of whom there are now 22,000 and predicted to be 30,000 by the end of this decade. These residents realise that the future of our centre lies in a traffic-free environment where people of all abilities and disabilities can move about without fear of dying prematurely from traffic fumes or being flattened by a 10-ton bus. If the council votes to put traffic back into Pinstone Street, it will be killing not just its residents, but the whole future of its expensive and potentially exciting new building project that aims to revitalise our struggling town centre. In 2019, the council took the brave step to pedestrianise the centre because of COVID. Let's know whether our active travel commissioner supports a policy that will return us to the polluted 1980s for only a few months before the heart of the city development pedestrianises it again to connect the Peace Gardens to Radisson Hotel. Having managed public transport uh, city public transport all my working life, I can see what the problem is here, or what most of the problem is here. The new route layout needs a massive public information campaign and some decent infrastructure to shelter people from the rain and inform bus users where the services start and stop. Use every means at your disposal to explain where buses from each area arrive and where they leave from all under the council's and the passenger transport executive's control. Get these sorted, use the big signs that are around the city centre, the advertising signs, and much of the problem will be solved. But please don't ruin, ruin the city centre because you can't fix the present or visualise the future. And can I just finish by saying, if you want to see the future and you're not aware of this, there is a wonderful video that's just appeared on vimeo.com, V-I-M, the stuff we used to clean the sinks with, V-I-M, vimeo.com. And it's got a nine-digit number after it. Now, you may be familiar with this. I've only just seen it shortly before I came uh, to the meeting. But the nine-digit number is 60170-47-29. And that gives you an amazing view of what our new city centre will look like with a flying through video that makes it look so exciting and I'm very pleased that I live here. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you, members. Thank you, Mr. Sefton. Is there anything else you want to know or shall I move, make way for the next? Uh... Well, would you like somebody to respond to you? Oh, if, if anybody wants to ask any questions, I'll be delighted to answer. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank, right, thank you. you very much. Do you want me to respond? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought. Yeah. Uh, 
Anybody's got any comments? I'd be yes, very pleased. Yes, very pleased. So, I mean, I mean, briefly, yes. You know, you, you, your questions are, you know, highly relevant there. Um, but you were asking the, the position of uh, Dame Sarah Story, and um, now that she's just back from um, winning all the gold medals, um, and yes, you know, kind of preoccupied with some, it, it, I think it's just right to say that you know this is something that you know she may not want to go on the public record on, but in terms of the active travel schemes right across the city. Um, it, it, this is something that Dame Sarah has been fully on board with um, for you know, all the reasons that you described as part of her role of um, advising the region on the issues of you know, the, the need for active travel um, in particular for people on disabilities. So. Uh, I'm kind of a bit uncomfortable with presumptive statements being made in other people's names. Um, Having spoken to Sarah and myself and been on a bike ride and been embarrassed by her whizzing off into the distance, um, I wouldn't presume to speak for her. Um, I, I don't think it'd be wise for any of us to do that. So um, please can we avoid such such a uh, rhetoric? The response for me is, is that um, you know, the position has been support of these schemes because the, the point is that these, these um, active travel schemes about um, improving transport right across the city are not simply just been magicked up this week. Um, and have been uh, supported by the region for some time. Um, the, the, the main point uh, in relation to any aspect of disability access and public transport and um, active travel is about the lack of infrastructure um, and that you know, mixing that with vehicle access and say, is not the right approach there. So I think that probably answers two of the questions there. Um, and in terms of the... Um, that the, the promotion of public transport, um, which you can see is something that you've got a certain area of expertise in, um, the, the wider proposals here um, are all about promoting a, a, a step change in the, sort of the wraparound approach to public transport, and that's why um, the schemes that are proposed involve you know, new stops, the, the, the real-time bus information, the audio-visual stuff, which is something that uh, disability groups have been looking for for a long while. Um, seats in bus stops, which is something that uh, people keep going on about. Um, writing coordinated bus stops, um, coherence to where the bus stops are. And those are all part of the arrangements that are proposed to be brought forward in these schemes um, that are um, planned. Um, in addition to that, and this is slightly outside the schemes, of course, you know, we're working with the bus operators and, you know, we've had some productive conversations about ways to make buses more attractive to the people who uh, don't currently use them. Um, I don't know if you also want to add anything to that, or perhaps more factual. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's Matthew Reynolds here, Transport Planning and Infrastructure Manager at Sheffield Council. Um, yeah, D Douglas has just outlined what's in the proposal of the Transforming Cities Fund slash Connecting Sheffield scheme. Um, that's all costed within the business case. So, Mr. Sefton, you'll be pleased to know that we are con certainly considering this. Um, it feeds into the bigger picture debate around the bus service improvement plan, which is all about how we can provide that step change in public transport priority within the city centre. Um, so, it is all very much part of the outline business case, which was submitted to Sheffield City Region. So, we are absolutely aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Sefton. Would you like to leave us now? Thank you. Thank you. While we're waiting, chairs, can I suggest as a point of order that the next person who doesn't ask a question and wasn't an answer um, doesn't have to be invited, you know, we have to invite answers to people for people who don't want them. Thank you. And given the time, it is now half past one, yeah. we've had one question. Thank you. The point is noted. Councillor Ockham. Chair, do we need to start considering now removing standing orders to extend the meeting because the rate is going to go. We're going to be here till 10 o'clock, won't we, when polls close, funnily enough. <laughs>
trouble that we've got, members, is that there's quite a few people that have submitted questions that have not got to us. So that is why um, this, is, this is taking a bit of time for them to... And they've turned up today, so I feel that because they've turned up that we should listen to the questions. Welcome, sir. Would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Ah, excellent. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Martin, and I am um, the engagement worker for Disability Sheffield, and I've been uh, assisting several groups in the city, including Access Liaison Group and Sheffield Transport for All, uh, to prepare a response to the city centre Connecting Sheffield scheme, which I believe all of the members have received in advance. So in, in the response uh, that, that um, uh, has been sent to, to everyone, this was prepared at the end of last year and the beginning of this year by the groups I've just mentioned. It, it is a, excuse me, I'm struggling a bit with the light. <laughs> I believe that the response is pertinent to your discussion today, uh, giving some depth into the issues both of, the per of permanently losing buses at Pinsent Street and the gains of improving paving, paving services, um, which currently, at the moment, cause difficulty for many people, whether wheelchair users, whether camber the pavement hits people towards the road, and indeed also people with severe sight impairments. Put simply, level pavements do make a big difference on the ease of getting around the city. As I understand it, removing the active travel aspect of the city centre scheme would mean handing millions of pounds back in central government money, because it would not be possible to actually put alternative schemes in place in the short time available. I want to make it clear that there are both wins and losses, whichever way the decisions go today and in coming weeks. It makes a big difference if buses are back on Pinston Street. There are many people struggling, and I suspect there will be others here today that will go into more detail. But equally, if we do not find a way of investing in some of the, the difficult parts of the city centre to move around in, then that also is a problem. The response highlights the essential nature of getting the city centre circular bus route if Pinson Street is to be closed. It needs to serve Barkers Pool and the Town Hall area in particular, as these are particularly cut off, not only by distance, but the large amount of hill to climb. And I draw members' attention to some of those calculations, particularly note the, the difference from around about 100 metres to over 400 metres in the current setting of, of the scheme. At the end of the day, the success um, of the city does depend on disabled people being able to access the, the city and take part in whatever happens from being able to access this chamber, which is one of the more cut off points at this time, to whatever shops and other entertainment venues are here. Can the committee ensure that the access, uh, can, can the committee reassure that the access liaison group, Disability Sheffield and Transport for All groups, that you will take seriously the report that, um, or the, the response that's been put in front of you, both the pros and cons of both directions that you could take today? and ensure that um, aspiration for the city's future is part of that consideration, an aspiration to make sure that disabled people have an easier time accessing the city in the coming years. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Um, would somebody like to answer that? Yes, certainly. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, uh, first to say that yeah, as, as you will know, you know this perfectly well, um, the officers have um, been engaging with you know, groups like the Access Liaison Group and actually have enormously benefited from that. Um, uh, I, I know that Matt Reynolds has certainly been to our meetings, does a 
to present myself. Um, and I think that you know, the, what's important about um, working with groups like the Access Liaison Group is to get into the detail of these schemes because we all know that you know, the city centre has been really inaccessible for lots of people for a long time. Um, and it, it is that detail, and that's, this is the essence of the, of the issue really, it's about looking at the detail about what actually are the barriers rather than knee-jerk reaction to what other people think the barriers might be for other disabled people. It's actually really useful to know directly from people who've got you know, the range of disabilities. And I, and I know the, the, the point about um, looking at pan disability groups, you know, where you, you look at people from all different angles you know, and, and hear their views is really important. And that's what can be done there. That is also the point of all the proposals that are um, to go forward. Um, whether it's part of the, you know, the Connecting Sheffield or the Transforming Cities, uh, and the, the Future High Streets Fund, which is all about the transformation of Fargate and that area. Because the fact is we know that actually the area, you know, across the city centre does have, you know, curbs in the wrong place. It does have um, barriers and obstacles and cobbles and bad lighting and bad signage. Um, you know, all those things just make it really difficult. What we've actually got is the possibility for transformation of the city centre. And we are in a situation where we can look forward to the future. The, the whole nature of the city centre is changing and there's a real chance to make it so much more accessible for disabled people. So that's, that's one of the really important things there. Um, and personally, I'm quite keen that we don't lose that and we don't reverse all that. And the other thing you mentioned is the electric feed freebie. Um, you know, I'm personally, I'm you know, really pleased to you know, know that there's a bid for funding that's gone into going into government for that. Um, I'd really like to see that. We, we did have the electric freebie in Sheffield and um, I think between 2007 and 2014. Over that time, it built up her patronage and became very useful. Uh, and of course, was especially useful for people with disabilities who were older. Um, it was a pity that we lost that in 2014. Um, but it happened, we can do that. The other loss that um, you know, I was personally very vexed about um, because I knew the impact of it was when the council made the decision to cut funding to shop mobility. That was in 2017. Shop mobility was a really important charity, most especially because it was a, um, a disabled person's user-led organization. And in terms of disability politics, that is incredibly important for the empowerment of people with disabilities. Um, it was a retrograde step that this council decided on that side at that time, in my view. Um, and the Councilor impact Johnson, of that, would you round it up, please? We've got uh, I will, yes, of course. But it is an important point, this, because we need to look at the rounded picture of disability access. I, I don't. Have you got some? I'm just asking officers if you've got some latest update on the shop mobility scheme. So. Because, as you know, um, it was replaced with a commercial enterprise not run by disabled people, but and it was at least something that has now ceased because of being commercial interest. Um, they, they lost interest in providing that service. Where, where are we with it now, Rob? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Tom Finnegan-Smith. I'm the Head of Strategic Transport, Sustainability and Infrastructure at the City Council. Um, in terms of uh, shop mobility, um, the current position is that we've been having discussions with uh, Sheffield Bid about the potential um, uh, on the, the back of the, the previous scheme uh, ceasing, uh, whether there'd be a, an opportunity to bring forward um, a, a new offer uh, around shop mobility. And that is something that we've been uh, having discussions uh, with the bid about. It's something that they are looking into at the moment um, and uh, those discussions have been positive and hopefully over the next um, uh, few weeks uh, we'll have a clearer position around um, the, the potential to introduce the scheme. Chair, can I just have a point of information? The freebie bus, I was a cabinet member that introduced it, wasn't electric. It wasn't an electric bus that ran around the city centre. That, that's quite, quite right, Councillor Lodge, yes, you, you, it wasn't at the time. The, the aim is that if we have one now, um, then we'd aim for it to be electric for the obvious reasons. It's come along since time, yeah. 
So I'm sorry, I felt wasn't clear about that. Uh, just, I, I suppose, Chair, if I can just indulge a moment. Uh, we, we'll be, if we have this issue of shop mobility, it's something that would be particularly helpful, I think, if the committee could endorse a new shop mobility proposal. It might be something to have a think about um, later on. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Martin, uh, for coming today. Do we have a next questioner ready? Thank you. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question, please? No, you need to press the button on the right-hand side. You need to, sorry, somebody will help me with that. It's on. Thank you very much. I'm Martha Folds. Um, I'm a member of the Access Liaison Group and Transport for All, but speaking in a personal capacity. So thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. And I want to first of all preface my question by saying that the project represents gains and losses for disabled people. Um, and to point out that we're a diverse group, we're not a homogenous group that all think and do the same thing. As a visually impaired white cane user, the changes to Pinston Street have impacted my ability to travel uh, safely and independently Tactile paving hasn't always been updated to reflect the new layout and natural routes around Pinton Street um, involve switching side. And if you don't switch side without realizing and without seeing, then you can end up in the middle of a cycle way. And obviously someone that relies on my white cane on the ground, that's really dangerous. Um, but I want to say whatever the committee's decision can you assure blind Sheffielders that you'll prioritise our safety, inclusion and equality? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Johnson, do you want to answer that? Sure, thanks, yes. Um, thanks, Martha. Yes, that's very helpful. I don't know if you heard the answers to previous questions in the... In the no, um, I think there's a problem with... It's just not being transmitted there. In that case, I'll have to... Um, I, I was in the anti-room waiting to come oh, right, in. OK, yes. Well, um, I, I'll, I'll keep it brief then, but it was to say that um, in answer to James Martin's question, um, I talked a little bit about you know, the um, uh, work of the Access Liaison Group, the need to look at detail in, in design there, um, reflecting the fact it's pan-disability and it covers you know, a lot of different disabilities, all of... Uh, you know, all people have different needs. Um, but to say that the, the issue here is about the opportunities, if the schemes go ahead, um, to actually make the city centre far more accessible because it has not been accessible enough for many years. Um, I also talked a bit about the, the, the shop mobility scheme, which was a user-led organisation um, and whose funding was cut, um, and about the electric freebie, which was um, not related to a, a disability-related decision, but it was something that, when it was cut in 2014, was a loss because that was particularly useful for people with disabilities who were older uh, for, for different reasons. Um, so. In terms of um, whether we can give guarantees, I think it does depend on what the council decides to do. But the really important thing is that on the schemes that are proposed, and which have been under development for the last couple of years, um, it is about looking at the whole future of the city centre and what it looks like. And, and of course, that would include how easy it is to get about. The 
the, the devil of this is in the detail of the design, and we talked um, a moment ago about you know, things like, we well, mentioned tactile um, um, paving, um, which agree isn't the wrong place at the moment, um, but also the right curbs, the curb lines in the right place, and the issues with, with cobbles, with wayfinding, and so on, which are, are so much wider than an issue about you know, whether a particular bus runs on a particular road. And there's, we know that you know, the schemes can go ahead, then there'll be the opportunity to, for disabled people to feed into that and go from there. We'll have to see what this uh, committee feels about that and whether we actually want to move ahead to that or whether we want to move back to something that is a bit like it was, which of course was very difficult for disabled people to, to move about in. Um, certainly trying to cross Pinston Street when there's a line of traffic coming down there, um, you know, a lot of people found that difficult. Um, it wasn't great then. Um, there are some people who'd like to go back to that. Um, and I think for reasons of access, we'll probably want to resist that. Also want to resist um, changes for the sake of changes, because actually the other thing we know is that the impact on many disabled people from readjusting is something that you know, is difficult. And I think we all accept it was difficult when the emergency measures were brought in for social distancing, because there were some quite sudden changes there. Um, there's no point doing that all over again just for the, the sake of it. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I think, I think that's all I need yeah, to Thank you. Right. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah. Thank you, Martha, uh, for coming along to answer your question. Hello, welcome. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Yes, I, I'm Jenny Carpenter from the Sheffield Climate Alliance, and in particular from its transport lobbying group. My question is this, and it's been partly answered already. Given the urgent need to reduce the city's carbon emissions and air pollution, is it not possible to maintain the Pinston Street priority measures for walking and cycling while at the same time providing a frequent small electric bus service to enable and encourage elderly and less mobile people to access the city centre more readily by public transport. Thank I'll just you. Make, make, make one or two comments. The measures taken seem to me to be in the interest of prioritising walking and cycling rather than the use of motorised vehicles and it's a kind of um, foretaste of what is going to be possible um, when we get to further development of the redevelopment of the city centre. They are significant in demonstrating the council's commitment to reduce carbon emissions and to improve air quality, both of which are very important. The council could look very silly if it goes back on these measures. Um, I remember the um, rather bit of a fiasco about the cycle lanes on Shales Moor. And going back on them might well prejudice government funding for future walking and cycling schemes. But we recognise that the measures have made it very difficult for elderly and less mobile people to access, access the City Hall, Fargate, Surrey Street, businesses, which include banks, most of the banks, and Marks and Spencer. And there is evidence that substantial numbers are being deterred from coming into town by car, which is good, but also by bus, which is bad. Thank you very much. I don't think I need an answer, do I? I, I, did, I did wonder whether it would have been better, uh, Chair, if um, we could have if we could have heard all the questions quickly and then had an answer which picked up the rest of them. 
uh, there's still um, about 12, no, it's not quite only about, about at least another eight people, I think, waiting to come. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Would you like to introduce yourself and ask a question, please? Is that it? Yeah. 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 Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Rogers, and I'm here re representing Cycle Sheffield Streets for People, which is an organisation which campaigns for better active travel provision in the city. And we'll just uh, read out the question for you. So the changes that were made to Pinston Street to its current form were funded by central government uh, through sort of the emergency COVID measures. Um, the central government has made the decision to withdraw funding and access to funding uh, for future schemes from such uh, councils that have undone um, work that have been funded under the same scheme. Uh, this include West Sussex, uh, Liverpool, Brighton and Hove. So the question that we have for you is what risk assessments have council officers undertaken on the impact that uh, will have the likelihood on um, the funding for schemes that are also being funded by central government, uh, including Tinsley, Crooks, Nether Edge, and the Sheaf Valley, and how much liaison have they had uh, on this subject with their counterparts in the Department for Transport? Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Uh, is the, who wants to answer? Answer, I mean, so first of all, there's no risk assessment because there's no decision to remove all the walking and cycling um, measures. It's really important to know that there have been a series of decisions over the last two years, um, if you would, a bit more, to proceed with a number of schemes that all interlock and overlap um, to create a, a full network right across the city. And, and the bit on Pinson Street is just a little bit in the middle. Um, it's part of the network with the schemes from Nether Edge from Bone Grieve, looking through um, right through to um, Ashcliffe and Darnall. So the decision uh, uh, of the council is to go ahead. Um, there is no risk of losing government funding. If the council were to reverse its um, decisions, um, then yes, presumably there would be, because the government's made that very clear. I, I think it's somewhere in the report that, um, to quote from the government guidance, that says what there will be. Uh, I don't know if the officers want to add anything more to that then. Thanks, Douglas. I think just to add is that, yeah, it's obviously prudent for us to have started these engaged, these engaged discussions with the funder, Sheffield City Region. Um, so we have been, and we're trying to work out exactly what levels of funding would be at risk, to what level should we go down this road. It's only proper planning, I think, from that, from that perspective to start having those discussions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming and asking okay. your question today. Thank you. Uh, the next questioner I've been informed is not here to ask the question, so uh, Deborah's going to read it out for us, and we will get a written response to them. Thank you, Chair. Um, the question is from uh, Chris Sterry, and uh, it, it, the question is, with regards to the works being done in Sheffield, especially around the Town Hall, I understand that a number of parking bays are to be lost, including blue badge bays which is a concern as not all persons are able to use public transport and for some taxis are not ideal. This is expressly so, so for wheelchairs due to the insufficiency of wheelchair bays on some buses and with regards to taxis for wheelchairs to be securely clamped within the vehicles. For a secure clamping, the wheelchairs need to be either facing forward or rear facing, otherwise, otherwise they are unstable. So actions need to be taken to provide more secure facilities for wheelchair travel. This brings me to Blue Badge Bays, which again many in Sheffield are not suitable for wheelchair embarking, and as in many bays there is insufficient space for vehicles to be able to park in a Blue Badge Bay to enable wheelchairs to be loaded or unloaded. Also, in many, if not all, bays there are not any safe areas around the bays to enable safe access to load or unload as there are in blue badge bays in car parks. 
So more spaces need to be available around all blue badge bays and certainly more bays for wheelchair accessible access vehicles. Thank you, Deborah. We will get a written response to uh, Mr. Jerry. So, thank you. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and read out your question, please? No, you need to press it again on the right hand. That's it. Got it. Uh, yeah, my name is Stuart Bywater. I'm a resident within uh, the city centre. I live at St Paul's Chambers, uh, overlooking the Peace Gardens, and uh, I, I owned a business in the city centre for over 20 years. Um, it's a very simple question, um, and a lot of it's been answered before, um, but it's, it's, have any of the councils in favour of reopening Pinson Street to traffic any evidence that this move would have any advantages, either economically, uh, environmentally, or indeed socially? to the residents of the city of Sheffield. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Bywater. Would anybody like to respond to that? I think the question specifically for a, a councillor in favour of opening up to motor traffic, and that's not me. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to answer. Well, we'll get you a, a written answer, OK? Because I don't want to put anybody on the spot right now. So we're going to be having a debate later. So. We'll get you a written answer. Chair, okay? Chair, Chair, if I might, I mean, I mean, I, 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 take, I take the point, and I wouldn't advocate um, opening um, up to cars, but I do think there is a, the question we need to debate at this meeting later is access to buses to Pinson Street. And I think we would all support the electric bus if we put it in our budget amendment for, for a few years now. But the question I think we need to look at and address ourselves to is, is should Pinson Street be open to other buses? And, you know, my mind is still open on that one. Um, uh, I think there are issues with, with access to the city centre for people in, in more outlying parts of uh, the town who might have struggle to walk distances. And I think that's what we're going to have to look at. Thank you, Councillor Rotten. That's, we're going to be debating that today. So, okay. Thank you. Would you have the next question already, please? Councillors, there's just four more questions left, so we're getting to the end of them. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Would you press the button on the right? Your mic will come on. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Lee Thompson, Partnerships Manager working for Sustrans, which is a sustainable transport charity. Um, our priorities are around uh, removal of traffic, making the environment uh, livable um, and easy for people to walk and cycle. Um, I've, I have submitted quite a few questions online, um, and I don't expect answers to these because they're quite big questions, but um, just to quickly uh, rattle through a few. Um, well, I would appreciate a, a written response at some point. Um, one is around what are the benefits of reintroducing buses and cars to a pedestrianised area. Um, and if there's any modelling results that have been done, any kind of pre or post engagement as well. I think it would be really interesting to see uh, you know, what residents, local businesses um, and visitors uh, have got to say about it. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that... Um, I see this is, is around the status and the perception of Sheffield City Council. Um, I think a previous um, incumbent referenced it earlier about the relationship between DFT and about how Sheffield City Council might be perceived. Is it going to be perceived as a, a city that is not only you know, dealing with its current challenges, but also a future proof in, you know, in the face of climate crisis that we've got? Um, I would have to argue that given the, the reintroduction of cars and buses into an area is, uh, is, is a big step backwards. Um, I think there's, there's lots of points that I could make, but they're very similar in vain to what's already been said. Um, so, so I guess it's just the main issue and the main point that I've got is just around the ambition of Sheffield City Council. And it is a bit of a concern to me that it seems counter counterintuitive that 
you know, a lot of other cities like Manchester, for example, are heading in that direction where they are removing uh, traffic and they are claiming space and they are prioritising pedestrians and cyclists. Um, and this seems totally um, counterintuitive to it. So I'll, I'll just kind of close to that because I know that there's quite a lot of people and we ain't got much time. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Somebody want to answer or comment? Sure. Yeah, well, well thanks for that. So appreciate it. Um, and I think it's fair to say that you've sent a number of questions and, yeah, we can no doubt yeah, provide those in the, the usual way and put the answer on the website, etc. Um, but on the main points, yeah, in terms of the status and perception of the council, it's quite right that to flag that up to us. But what I should say, and I don't know if you had the answers to previous questions, um, for the past two years, the council's made quite a series of decisions to take all the Transforming Cities Fund uh, schemes forward, together with things like the Future High Streets Fund, interrelating with the heart of the city, uh, and so on. The, the point about those decisions is to create a network of accessible walking, cycling routes that cross the city. That is the current status of the council's decision. Um, and I, for one, would like to see us continue with those. Um, there has been no decision to, to do a U-turn, um, to put it that way. Um, you, if you had the previous answer, you may have heard that you know, the previous question was asking about um, the uh, risk of loss of funding um, if that happened. And I am aware that Sustrans also funds uh, some of the um, uh, council's work around provision of, of uh, active travel routes. Um, so I think that is a point. And your points about future proofing for climate change, I think, are absolutely bang on. We declared a climate emergency in February 2019. Um, we are now trying to put that into practice. Um, whether that's reversed is for the, the, the council as a whole. Thank you. Mr. Bernwood, uh, thank you for coming and asking your question. We'll get some written answers for you. Okay. Next question, we're ready. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself and ask your question? Um, my name is Thomas Atkin. I'm a member of the Sheffield Young Carers Action Group, although I'm representing myself in a personal capacity today. My question is that both as a carer and a disabled person myself, I found the Pinter Street closure to actually be helpful. With my set of disabilities, I've found it easier to walk through up the new tarmac path rather than the uneven uh, paving stones on the existing Pinster Street pavement. And with my dad's wheelchair, we find it a lot easier to get up now there being more space, so no more weaving in and out of people. I'd also like to ask if the council has took in the consideration that people who have autism spectrum disorder or ADHD that have sensory processing issues will be finding the, their situation vastly improved in the city centre due to the decrease in noise pollution on Pinston Street, allowing the Peace Garden to suddenly become a haven for people with sensory processing issues. And finally, my question is that um, with the Mid-City House development going before the Planning Committee, um, have the Council noted the impact on that by having reduced buses and therefore reduced noise? Thank you. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Thomas. It's very useful to um, have that perspective on the range of different disabilities. I, I don't know if you heard the answers that we gave before because of the technical problems that we had, but re reflected on the range of different disabilities that people have in, in Sheffield. Um, someone made the point that not all disabilities are homogeneous. You know, that everyone's affected in different ways. Um, but also to say that we accept that you know, the city centre has been um, has had poor accessibility for many years now. Um, what I'd really like to hope is that um, the Transforming Cities Fund gives us the opportunity to 
um, make the city centre much more accessible for people with quite a range of disabilities. Uh, and I mentioned before things like, like drop curbs, the tactile paving, the cobbles, which are difficult, whether you're uh, walking with a, with a cane or in a, a, a wheelchair, or even neither of those things. Um, the, the wayfinding in particular, and, and you, you've raised something new about the impact of noise pollution, and of course the city centre out here, um, you, when you hear everyone enjoying the peace gardens and the, uh, um, the outdoor entertainment that's been gone over the, uh, over the last few weeks, um, it is a lot more peaceful. That really has an impact on people's um, ability to um, enjoy the city centre, and you know, I'd, I'd like to see that continue. It doesn't benefit us to have, you know, uh, a long line of um, noisy and dirty buses going down in that bit of space where we have now created an oasis. The, just the other point that you might want to know is that um, there's the future plans for Pounds Park, which is, um, I think, a couple of million pounds worth of um, development there. That's, been, that's in the heart of the city development. Obviously, people comment that the city sends a lot of building sites at the moment. It is. It's coming to fruition. But there is this um, Pounds Park there. Part of that funding comes on, on the well, funding for that park comes on the back of the Transforming Cities Fund because Transforming Cities Fund is not just about um, use of roads, it's not just a transport scheme, it is about the environment in which we live and work um, and, it, and it is about transforming that. So uh, I think that probably is useful to know. Um, and Let's hope that continues. That has been the direction of travel of council decisions over the last two years, and that really ought to continue. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Thank you for coming along today and asking the question. Councillor Douglas, the, uh, the, the screen is working. They can hear us. The next question is going to be read out by Deborah, and then we've just got one more lady waiting to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a question from a resident called Robin Garner. How does the Council reconcile the possible return of motor vehicles to the city centre in light of their recently declared climate emergency? Thank you. We'll get in the written ones, sir. Welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself if you'd like to press the button on the right hand side it, it, and ask your question? Thank you. Um, my name is Jean Lugton. I'm a carer for my husband. I don't belong to any society. I'm a citizen. I've been a citizen of Sheffield for 74 years. I, I oppose to the closure of Kingston Street and Liverpool Street because it, 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 we have access, that's the only access we have to the, to the theatres and things like that. Uh, sorry, I wrote the question and I forgot. Uh, I challenge 78 councillors on the 23rd of March to post my husband from Arundel Gate or Furnival Gate up onto Otis Place. Nobody accepted the challenge. I challenge this committee now, or those who are with it, who want the closure, to push my husband from Arundel Gate and Furnival Gate up to Orchard Place. That's the challenge. Thank you. Councillor Douglas Johnson. Thank you for coming back. It's, uh, it's always good to, to have those points there. Um, we've, we've already discussed the fact that you know, there are um, different um, aspects of disability that are affected in different ways by going around the city centre. And we've just heard from someone who's uh, found that the changes are a benefit. Um, so that's, that's not to um, diminish yours at all, because you know, we accept that there have been some difficulties you know, with the changes that have gone so far. Um, the, the point is that there, are, there is a scope for major transformation about the whole accessibility of the city centre. And of course, there are many people uh, with many different types of disability. And, and the problem, with, as with always, as with any uh, design scheme, any development, is that um, as you make improvements for one, it's very easy to you know, cause disadvantages for other people. So although you personally you know, have um, explained that you know, you've got additional difficulty with the particular journey that you make frequently, um, then that is something that's definitely in the mix. It's definitely being considered. Just the other thought there was, um, I mean, as you mentioned, um, going to the theatres, uh, and of course, that's actually one of the uh, routes, I think, that um, there is 
um, an improvement with the current changes because the, the bus stops now are much nearer to the theatres. And so that's one of the advantages for people with disabilities. Um, you appreciate the point about Orchard Square, but going to theatres, um, for students going to Haddam University, for instance, people going to railway station along the back route, um, there are advantages there. The, the other thing I was thinking is that, um, I mean, on, on the routes that you've come down, you've described it, um, although you talked about getting off at Arundel Gate, um, if you take the route round the corner um, and get off at um, where the the old Red Gate site was, uh, there's, there's the new stops there. That actually makes you much more level access if you wanted to come up to the, uh, the, the top of Fargate. And um, if I could so it, it is uphill from Furnival Gate as well, but it is also longer. It is 0.4 miles from Furnival Gate. It's 0.3 from Orchard, from Arundel Gate. And it, it is uphill. Yeah. Yes, that's right, yeah, it, it is. It's the, there was a slight choice there between length of the walk and the gradient, and, and yeah, those are you know, real issues. Would you like to push my husband up from either of those places, please? I have emailed you twice, and twice you have not replied. Yes, I, I know. I, I think you made the point that you've emailed um, um, all of us, in fact, um, I think back in, um, in um, March, March or February last I year. I emailed 78 councillors. Yeah. Eight replied. Yeah. Two or two, uh, six or two responses, and two it was not delivered. Yeah. Well, it's not very good in reply, is it? Sorry, if we've all disappointed. Eight out of seventy-eight. Sorry, sorry that you've not had your response. I'm, I can only uh, apologise that you've not had any responses from us, uh, Councillor Dale. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want to come in, but Douglas, you've still not answered the question. Are you prepared to push this lady's husband and or the officers that are making the decisions to experience what ca carers are having to deal with when pushing people through the city centre? If it helps to demonstrate the point, then yes, um, that's, that's no problem. I'll you know, meet up with you and Tony sometime and um, we can do that. You name the date and the time. My husband will come to town on the bus, which I've come today. That's the reason why he's not with me. And as I said, you name the day and the time. And if it's convenient for us, we will come and you can do it. And anyone else that wishes to take it up. Okay, that, that would actually be very helpful. Thanks. Uh, Councillor Rooney, you want to come in? Uh, yes, please. I mean, if Douglas really wants a test of how fit he is, you might want to try uh, pushing a wheelchair from uh, the railway station up Howard Street. That would test you. Thank you about that, please, because the railway station is, act is actually open accessible to disabled people. The disabled parking is quite away from the, from the railway station entrance. And also to drop off and drop on with a public transport, for any transport, public transport, it's not convenient. Thank you very much for coming today and asking your question. Um, Douglas, as uh, Councillor Johnson, has uh, accepted your challenge and I'm sure we'll get a report from that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Jones, do you want to come in? I, I, I get the feeling from mutterings of my, my own and others behind me that there may be several volunteers. Okay, did you hear that, uh, Miss? Wilson, is it? Miss Wilson. Wilson. We've got some volunteers to. Uh, I don't think you can do it as a relay. I think yeah. it's one person pushing. Yeah, I am. I'll be interested. Right, good. councillors, I think that that was the last question, and we'll now move on to item seven, Pinstone Street. Would you like to do, give us a quick summary? Um, which, which officer is it, Matthew, or. or, or We've all read the report, so just a, a summarise would uh, help, uh, because there are lots of members have got questions. Councillor Rotten. Sorry, I'm to come in with questions. I'm, I'm happy to hear the report first, if there's an introduction. I think we just agreed about five minutes introduction, didn't we? So, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks, Chair. Um, I'll assume everyone's read the report, so I'll, I'll skip through the, the sort of background papers in the introduction side of it. 
Um, I think what we've actually seen expressed today through a lot of these questions is the meat of the key of the sort of key issues expressed within the paper. Um, bus access and bus stops is clearly one of the standout issues we've got with the with the scheme. Um, what we've explained within the paper, table table one, I think it is, demonstrates the sort of the accessibility challenge we've got, where there are some locations which have got better access and some locations that have got worse access. Um, and all part of the scheme is sort of the, the, the permanent scheme, um, the Connecting Sheffield scheme, is all about how we can work with, with people like uh, June Luxem there um, to find the solutions and mitigating options to make those gradients better, to make the crossing points easier, to make the walking distances shorter. Um, that's typically um, around how we can solve the bus access through the, um, through the, the sort of the final project. Um, bus stops is also a key thing. Uh, again, this has come up a few times. Um, at the moment, it's a very temporary solution. Um, obviously, we need to get clarity as to what the, the future project looks like before investing money in those, further in those temporary measures. Um, but certainly, I, I think, as I said in, in one of the responses to the previous questions, is that we have for fully costed uh, options around public transport improvements at the stops, which includes audio-visual information, seating, lighting, potentially greening as well, um, and a, a general step change in that, um, in the, the sort of the customer experience side um, of the public transport network uh, as a result of the changes to both Rockingham Street um, and Arundel Gate. The other side to the bus change, the public transport network, and this is the bit which maybe members haven't fully appreciated, is the bus gates which will be going in as, as part of the, or proposed to be going in as part of the scheme, significantly improve bus reliability, journey time improvements um, across a number of, well, if, if across pretty much every single bus service which impacts the city. So that means benefits will be felt across every single bus route across the city. Um, and that's the bit which is obviously key to uh, the public transport element of the project. Um, there's also a great level of connectivity, great level of interchange, um, and hopefully that will translate itself into a much more robust commercial market, which the people of Sheffield should see uh, as a long-term um, sort of benefit of, of, this, of the change within, within the heart of the city. Um, I've mentioned the bus service improvement plan. Um, members might not be aware of this, but there is a, a fundamental change to um, to the way public transport is going to be operated in the future, coordinated through Sheffield City Region as, I, as our transport authority and combined authority, um, they will be looking to see how there is great level of control around bus operations, um, of which uh, one way will be the enhanced partnership model, uh, which looks to bring in a little bit more control over the private sector, i.e. the bus operators, but it's still going to be a cooperative arrangement whereby local authorities will need to demonstrate an improvement um, around bus routing, for example, um, and then that will be met by operator commitments. So that's an important aspect to this project. Um, the other side of it is, um, is just around the interaction with the other schemes within the city centre. Sheffield is changing, the city centre changes, the city, the city centre needs to change. High streets have been on, on decline for many, many years. Um, it's not just a, a sort of a, a COVID coronavirus reaction. Mary Porters did a review nearly 10 years ago which demonstrated a substantial need to change the high street. This has been exacerbated through online, market, uh, online um, marketplaces like Amazon, etc., uh, which have fundamentally changed the consumer demand and the market for city centres, so we have to change it. One element of that is the public realm bit, and that's what we're trying to get through with this project, which, again, introduces greenery, open space, event space, animation, all the bits which make it a nice place to live, a nice place to visit, importantly, a nice place to spend time and, and get some money into the local economy. That's what we are aiming to do. Um, specifically on the project, we've got the Future High Street Fund, which was a, a, an amazing achievement from the council, 15 million pounds to develop Fargate, transform it. Um, that requires a, um, a removal of traffic at the, at the top of Fargate, uh, principally Leopold Street and Pinson Street. And that's the coordinated measure in which we've been working with other project teams to make sure that there are projects being implemented and bidded for, which do align to a, to a strong vision of making the city centre a much more usable place. On the other side of Pinston Street is, is Heart of the City. So that stretches right the way from where the Barclays Bank is on the corner of Pinston Street, all the way down to where the HSBC building is at Grosvenor House, and then all the way back towards Division Street. So very much the beating heart of what our city is going to look like in the future. 
And this scheme aims to set that within a vibrant place where we'll have a, a high quality hotel, which will bring in, again, for the visitor economy, which is incredibly important. Um, but also, as, as, as Douglas has mentioned in one of the responses, that there's a two million pound contribution from Transform the City for the Pounds Park development. Pounds Park is not just gonna be an important element of how the city looks and it feels from a business and a commerce perspective, because it, it will be a really shining example of how we are changing the nature of the city centre. But it's also the way in which we can bring in family living into the city centre, which again is gonna be fundamental to our, our ambitions through you know, the future growth of the city you know, within the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It's very much a generational change, which will be sort of delivered as part of this project. The other side of um, sort of the, the heart of the city project is delivering a city centre which will attract commerce. And from speaking to Sheffield Property Association, to the Chamber of Commerce, other investors, potential developers, they see this project as being very much a forward way thinking for the city. Um, again, one of the speakers mentioned it. It's exactly the sort of thing which they're doing in Manchester, exactly the sort of thing they're doing in Leeds. And I think one thing just actually to demonstrate the point is that if anyone's seen the plans for Oxford Circus down in London, oh, well, you, uh, the, the Westminster Council are actually looking to pedestrianise Oxford Street. The most, probably one of the most expensive retail areas in the world. And they're, they're seeing the benefit of bringing in more vibrancy into that environment. And that's exactly what we're trying to do within this project. Um, going a little bit further around, and, and this is one of the, the elements which we've, we've kind of, we've not really been explicit because it's something which we just wanted to um, kind of not emphasize really, but there is a real risk around hostile vehicle mitigation within the city. That is something which is a concern. That's something which has been raised by South Yorkshire Police. Now, that is obviously not a very good public statement to make, and we've tried to hold that from the public material, but I think at this point it needs to be known that that is a significant consideration for this project. The whole idea of locking out the, the motor traffic into the core centre has significant benefits for, for the relief of that project, and obviously goes away in our working relationship with South Yorkshire Police about creating Sheffield as a safe place to be. Um, that's something which obviously I think members need to be aware of. Um, going further on down, we, we, have, we have a significant policy commitment as well. Um, national government, regional government, local policies demonstrating that we need to start changing the way people behave. Travel behaviour needs to change. We need to see a more green and sustainable form of transport across the city. Um, this is replicated, as I said, across numerous levels of policy direction. And Sheffield needs to be aware that we need to do these sort of bold, bold actions and, and plans contained within the Transform the Cities programme, not just this one, because it radiates across all the projects. The city centre is the heart of the TCF project. And if this doesn't happen, we're, we're at risk of losing the, the incremental benefits which you then deliver from doing the, the spokes out to places like Kellam Island, places like the Advanced Manufacturing Innovation District, the Sheep Valley Cycle Route, for example, Netheredge, the, all the other bits in our active travel investment program, they would all be sort of de je jeopardized by not, do, not getting it right in the city center. Thank you, Matthew. Can I ask you to round it up, please? Because we've got an awful lot of people wanting to ask questions. Okay, thanks, Chair. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you. I would, uh, I'm just going to bring Councillor Rotman in now because he's got to leave at 2.30, isn't he, childcare? Um, thank you. Well, not for 2.30, but yes, fairly soon. Thank you. So um, I'm going to try and I'm going to leave some questions for colleagues. I know they're going to ask um, on, on disabled access and things like that, but I'm going to try and wrap my questions up into a single question if I can. Um, regarding access, I mean, the, the theme here is access versus um, the quality of the environment in the city centre. And you know, if we go too far on one extreme, go to a great environment that people can't get to, then, you know, there are people in the city who won't benefit from it, and that would be, that would be unfortunate. So, um, I suppose my question is, specifically, uh, let, let's suppose we don't reopen to Pinson Street to motor traffic in general, and I don't think anybody's calling for, for general motor traffic cars to, 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 to be on there. Um, what about... Um, well, there's a number of people who might might want to have access. For example, um, will we allow taxis to drive up to the new Radisson Blue to drop off guests? For example, will we allow wedding parties at the using the town hall? For example, to, to have their, their nice cars that people can wave at to, to go down Pinson Street. 
um, have we consulted the taxi trade actually more generally on, on, on the effects on, on their business? You know, if we allow electric buses, do we also allow electric taxis? Questions like that, have they been thought about, have they been answered? Um, as somebody myself, who when I visit the city centre, I do generally drive um, from council meeting, I, you know, obviously I use council car parks, but I'll, I'll often drive um, uh, on other times. I'd quite like to see the John Lewis car park reopened. I think that would be good. That would improve my access to the city centre. I don't need to use Pinson Street to access it if you provide another route. Um, it's a council car park. It's standing empty. Let's get it open. Let's get more people into the city centre and have a thriving city centre. Is that uh, one of the things you, you're considering? And then I suppose to, to, to kind of wrap up my question, looking forward and looking at the bigger picture, if this is part of a bigger uh, kind of green improvement to the city centre, um, can we expect... The, the, the next step in this to create more access problems for, for not just for disabled people, but disabled people, but also for bus users in general and motorists in general, or can we all continue to, to enjoy and access the city centre once it's the, the kind of the wonderful, beautiful, green, healthy environment that, it, that, that we want it to be? Thank you. Thank you. Councillor John. So just, just briefly, I mean, I'll, I'll ask um, Tom and Matt to give um, more detailed answer to that, but there is a point about the whole premise of the question that is being said that it's a question of access versus quality of environment. And the whole point is, it isn't. That is actually just wrong. Um, the whole point of the schemes is to improve access and to improve the quality of the environment. And so that, I mean, that's the, really the theme of Phil, the answer I was giving to people who were, uh, came to ask the questions here. Access has been poor in the city centre for a number of years, and so is the quality of the environment. We're actually on the cusp of being able to improve that, both those things significantly. What makes sense, I ask? Yes, thank you. Um, in terms of some of the points of access, um, uh, to um, specific locations such as the, the proposed hotel currently in development, then as part of the design of the, of the project, those, those drop-off uh, loading arrangements are being considered as part of the scheme. Um, so in, in terms of, unfortunately, we don't have detailed plans um, uh, that we can share on screen because the connectivity isn't working, but, but yes, we have uh, proposals to address um, loading and access arrangements um, for, for businesses that may be on Finston Street, um, that again will be considered as part of the scheme in a similar arrangement to the, the, the one that exists at the moment on Fargo, uh, where there's a time limited access uh, for loading directly in, uh, to businesses, but those pick off, pick up, drop off uh, locations again are being considered as part of the scheme. Um, we're working very closely with um, our colleagues um, who are leading on the Heart of the City scheme leading on all of those other kind of um, improvements that, that Matt mentioned in his summary, um, to make sure that it is integrated. Um, it, with with the, the kind of access arrangements, I mean, you mentioned kind of electric taxis or, or kind of electric buses. Uh, I think that the, the balance there is around um, actually the, the routing uh, of those services and those implications around access, accessibility has been mentioned and those wider accessibility issues that will be picked up also as part of the scheme. Um, we have um, considered the routing of a, 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 a city centre shuttle bus. Um, uh, obviously, previously the city had the freebie service, um, uh, which ran down Pinston Street um, as part of its route. We have looked at uh, routing options for that service we're working with um, colleagues at the South Yorkshire Passenger Transport Executive um, as part of a developing bid um, to a DFT fund for zero emission buses. Um, again, that is a work in progress. Um, that, that we have passed an, an early expression of interest gateway um, and um, that, that bid will be developed. Um, so if, if there are any other points you want me to come back on, I'm more than happy to. I think you've missed the uh, John Lewis car park. So again, um, I'm sure you'll be aware that there's a lot of work um, being undertaken at the moment to consider the, the future of John Lewis. Um, part of that is is looking at the, 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 the building itself and potential use. Um, the car park obviously exists at the moment. 
um, but that asset and condition and other issues around that need to be considered. Um, at, the moment, at this moment in time, there's no immediate plans for, for reopening that. And again, it is, it, it's wrapped up into the, the review of, of, of John Lewis in its own right. I think just in terms of this this project, uh, Councillor Otten, it's not within scope of the, the Connecting Sheffield scheme. So if it was to come forward, it would be separate to this. So just to clarify, the John Lewis building is still in the possession of John Lewis at the moment. It's, it's not ours. Um, I mean, they could operate a car park if they want, but they're not. Um, well, so thank you. So, I mean, if I can push back on your suggestion that this is all about better access, I do think you are sacrificing access for the benefit of the city centre environment. I mean, the city centre environment is a good and important thing, but, you know, I, I want to stick up for, for better access for people in the rest of the city. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I'm going to push back on that. I'm not going to, you know, invite a huge debate on it because there are other questions. Um, the, thing, the thing you didn't quite address was the future plans you know, if, this, if we do this and we keep it as is and then we do the, the put the pop pants on, on the little gate, as it says in the report, um, is that going to reduce access even further? I mean, or you, I, I, you can tell me now, you're not going to reduce access any more than you have already. So in, in terms of the Connecting Sheffield scheme, um, a, again, it's been mentioned already, but the, the, the core change to Pinston Street um, would be the same position with, uh, that exists now, as it would be within the Connecting Sheffield project. There are wider changes on Arundel Gate and Furnival Gate, and continuing changes on Rockingham Street that would come forward as part of the scheme. So the image at um, figure, let me just um, find it, figure two, kind of shows you uh, the context of, of the kind of uh, the Connecting Sheffield scheme expanding beyond Kind of the existing temporary arrangements on, on Pinston Street and um, the, the kind of transformational change on, on Pinston Street, the core traffic management access arrangements would, would stay the same. We're proposing that there would be a bus gate on a rumble gate um, and that would be, um, again Matt will probably tell me off if I've got it wrong, but um, it would allow access up to um, the Novotel. So it would be a northbound only bus gate um, for buses, taxis, and for those other vehicles that we allow through our bus gates in Sheffield. Uh, but that would, that would come in at, at Novotel. So it would allow access for residents to um, the uh, St. Paul's development. It would ac access round into Union Street, to the Chief Rated Car Park, and so on. The other bus gate would be on Furnival Street. Um, and that uh, would be a bus gate um, at just in advance of, I'm going to forget the name, is it Matilda Way? Yeah, mm. sorry. So that would be a bus gate just beyond Matilda Way. So, so uh, vehicles could drive up Furnival Gate and turn into Matilda Way for access. There's parking there that, that people use to, to local shops and facilities. Um, but the bus gate would be two way. So across um, kind of Moorhead, um, bottom of Pinson Street, that access there would be for, for, uh, for buses and again, those vehicles that we allow through our bus gates only. Um, so um, at the moment, you, you're probably aware that the movement from Charter Road across the top of the moor, that is a bus only movement. It would be effectively reflected going in the other direction. Okay, th thank you very much for those answers. I know the way I proposed my question, I was demanding no more restrictions. I, I think I, I will consider those bus gates because they may well be something I would be happy to support. Um, in the round. Um, so, but yeah, thank you for your answers. I'll, I will leave it there. Thank you. Councillor Lodge. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, th th there's lots and lots of questions and things here. Uh, and I'm trying to, you know, I'm writing things down from, from questions that members of the public asked and from, from answers that are going through from comments and, and from the report as well. One thing that was just interesting, I just picked up on there that, that Tom said there regarding electric buses and this funding bid and it mentioned zebra within there looking through you're saying it's been modeled and looked at the electric bus going down pinson street and leopold street you just i thought you just said it's been looked at as being considered as one of the options to use pinson street for an electric shuttle bus to go around the city center did, did i mishear that sorry yes yeah, the uh, along the kind of 
the previous freebie route went through Pinston Street, along Pinston Street past the Peace Gardens. That, that wouldn't be the route of um, the proposed shuttle service. Matt, do you want to kind of outline that? Yeah, Council Lodge, yeah, it, it's a fair question, so we'll just provide some clarity on that. Um, the route is still yet to be determined clearly, but what we've identified is that the key area where it needs to serve, if it was to serve anywhere, would be that Barker's Pool bit. Um, so, you know, where HL Brown is on that corner, um, that is the sort of the, the point. So whether we have to do highway changes to make it another way or whatever, they're the bits which we need to go into this next stage of design. But the bits where we've identified which need to be served are sort of, you know, obviously the railway station, because that's where people will be coming into the city, um, up towards that section there, because that sorts out your cambers and your level dif differences and all that stuff and starts to really tackle some of those accessibility challenges. Um, and then the other locations in the city centre, which will be uh, attraction points. So Pounds Park will probably be one, potentially goes down to Kelham Island. So these are the bits of detail which we need to work through. There's always a cost to this. We need to work out the hours of operation, whether it's a fair paying thing, how frequency it is, and all that sort of detail. But that is subject to this further work we're working with SYMPT on to try and establish what that product looks like. But we won't, it won't be running down Pinson Street because of the reasons we've explained before, different space, etc. But it could use Burgess Street, you know, the road, the road behind. But the critical bit where we're trying to get to is that section, um, just sort of Leopold Street, Pinson Street Farm Green area. So I hope that provides a bit of clarity. Thank you. Uh, I, I it makes it even more confusing, Chair, in all honesty, because what is the point of a city centre circular bus, free or otherwise, electric, hydrogen, low, ultra low emission vehicle, if it's not going to get people to where they want, where they can get in there? One of the, one of the things that's coming up, I, thank you for your answer, Matthew, I, I appreciate what you're talking and saying there, but I think one of the things that's come up is that this report, this today, was to look at the issue around buses on Pinson Street. And I think everybody in here wants to see a thriving, fantastic city centre, which is the envy of places throughout Europe and gets people in here. And if we can do that, fantastic. But there's no point if we're investing millions in there, in, in the heart of the city and creating commercial and creating retail facilities if people can't get to them. And if we're creating a, an island where nobody can get to. Uh, and sorry for the, for the comment there, Chair, but I, it's through things in the report. I've, I've looked at things and it talks about the bus service improvement plan within this report. Uh, and I appreciate, you know, we want to do everything to get people on public transport. And, but do you, do you really honestly see the no difference in getting off a bus on a Rundle gate and having to walk, and as June was saying, there's other people, and I'm not atypical of people of Sheffield, I'm 60, I have walked up from Pond Street, from the interchange today, and to get to the back door of the town hall, and, and you know, it's taxing to get up there. Now, I'm not the fittest person, I appreciate that, and I could do with losing a few pounds, and if I'm walking it more, no doubt I will. But I'm not atypical of the people of Sheffield, and that is a hard slog. So the question around, do you think it's realistic that people are just going to accept the buses and go there where they are? The other question is, what's the difference in the, in the levels from Arundel Gate up to the Town Hall and Leopold Square and Orchard Square? Because I look, and if I walk, and I, if I walk up from, if you get from the top of Howard Street, come across from, Howard, uh, from Hallam Square, you've got a ramp that comes up to Surrey, Surrey Street, uh, to the side of the Central Library, or you've got the escalator that goes through the Millennium Galleries or steps to get up. The front door of the Town Hall to the back door of the Town Hall is on a different floor. So what's the, the gradient, what's the, the height differences for people coming up? Because it's not just as, as you know, June that was there saying and put the challenge out that you've accepted to, to push her husband in a wheelchair. It's that general gradient that's going up. The Town Hall sits there and you talk about walking down the moor and you walk, walk up to the Town Hall and you walk down Fargate and you walk up High Street to Fargate to the Town Hall. It sits at the top. We're creating a space where people can't get to. So there's the question there about what's the, the difference in heights and the gradients and the, to, the topography. 
There's a question around consultation. The consultation was carried out at the end of last year, and it talks about consultation then. How many people were traveling and experienced trying to get around the city center with Pinston Street closed off compared to how many people are traveling now? And how many people who were shielding because they had accessibility issues, they had COPD, uh, they had all sorts of health conditions that stopped them coming into the city centre when this consultation was taking place, have now tried to return to the city centre and experience the problems that we're getting a lot of, consult uh, a lot of case work from. I've had two, two emails from people uh, in my ward and also from Greenpeace in my ward that have made the case for for keeping the the uh, Pinson Street closed. I was waylaid when I was watching cricket at the local cricket club by three different people on three different occasions about it. I was on the bus going home from work on what day are we now Thursday on Tuesday, and two different people spoke to me there about it. I've had someone come to the door and ask me about it. I've been at things in within the ward and people commenting about it. They're not firing in emails, they're not part of campaign groups, they're individuals. So how many people were consulted, how many of the consultees were people who were shielding and that were travelling, and do we think we ought to be consulting again because people can now see what it means and feel what the impact is rather than reading it in the paperwork. The consultation was based on the active tra travel measures that were brought in through funding from the government. And whilst it is part of the wider Connecting Sheffield strategy, they weren't consulted on the wider Connecting Sheffield strategy. That They were consulted on that, but not specifically because they weren't travelling, if you understand what I mean. So it, it, it's just trying to make that point there. I think the, there's a point about the equality impact assessment that's included within the report here that's about the... Uh, access to the Connecting Sheffield strategy. And every section is marked as low. Every section. Now, I appreciate on the basis of what that was conducted for, that was, that was fine because it was low impact and things. But we've heard from people that are coming in, and, and again, this lady, I, I would hardly say it's low impact if people are saying they can't push wheelchairs around, they can't push buggies around, they're carrying shopping. So... Are we going to do another quality impact, equality impact assessment? Because based around things after the reopening of the city, as more people are now travelling around and going in there. Uh, there, there was a comment about Oxford Street. It's, it's quite funny. I was down there, not last weekend, the weekend before, and walking around there. And I have to say, yes, you know, pedestrian crossings across Oxford Circus, if you look at that, buses going through, they go diagonally as well as across all the junctions. But Oxford Street is not Sheffield. Oxford Street is pretty flat compared to Sheffield. You know, you look at the, the, the heights of coming out as opposed to Oxford Street, and it's fairly level as you're going on Oxford Street. And I could walk it easily. So, uh, the, the, there was a, a, a it's, it's a comment about, there's been a lot of comments about the future high street funding and the risk, and I've seen reports in the papers of people making comments and saying there's a risk to the council. There's a risk to the council that we'll lose this funding. And yet we've heard there's no risk assessment being conducted. So how can we say there is a risk that we may lose the funding if no risk assessment has been conducted? Uh, and if that is the case, if you consider it to be a risk, when are we going to get the risk assessment that says all these things are at risk? To cut down on traffic for the top of Fargate is not, it's not beyond the wit of the council transport planners to, to look at accessing a route that's going through. You've already said we need to look at things if it's bringing uh, a shuttle bus that comes through around the corner of Leopold Street and things. And it's just looking at that. So, you know, it, I, I'm sure using ultra low emission vehicles, electric buses, hydrogen buses, and there are, there's a business in Sheffield that... Uh, that produces electric uh, produces hydrogen vehicles that they're using hydrogen buses in London using the, the technology that was developed here in Sheffield. There's a company that repowers the buses that we're using for uh, Veolia waste uh, collection trucks that, that are going out there. The bin lorries that's based in Sheffield. 
and I'm sure they've got the technology they're using that, that could be done through. So why can't we see this technology for buses going through there? We're not saying about all traffic, and I think Councillor Hatton said it, and other people have sort of indicated, we're not talking about opening it up as a free-for-all for everything, but we're talking about public transport. We talked in here and we've had comments in here about the need to, to get more green and sustainable transport and using public transport. But if we're not putting buses where people want to go, they're not going to use them. We've got a shiny brand new bus station that we built, the interchange, and nobody used it. All the buses went fantastic. We're stopping on High Street, we're stopping on Pinson Street, we're stopping on Leopold Street. We're using the places where passengers want to go. Are we in danger of turning around and saying, we know best because we're telling you you can get used to walking that distance because it's better for you and i know you're gonna to have to walk that distance but we think this is best it's balancing out the needs of the city center it's balancing out the the, the needs of the, the the citizens and one last thing i, I would uh, uh, you, you commented about Radisson Blue and the aspects of the hotel looking out. It'll look fantastic when it's looking out there and it's open out there. But are we, are we sort of suggesting, and I'm sure you're not, and it was probably me misinterpreting what you were saying, but are we suggesting, almost suggesting that a nice aspect for the hotel for visitors coming to the city centre can look out and enjoy that is better than the, the ease for people to get around, citizens of Sheffield, residents of Sheffield, workers, People who are coming to shop, people using the theatres, the nighttime economy, hospitality. Uh, and just one final comment I'll make there, Chair. And I'll, I'll, if I can come back later, I've got some more questions to ask, but I'd, I'd wait for my other people in. Uh, the hostile vehicle mitigation measures, uh, and, and uh, Mick will know because I was there when we had a walk around with the, the city centre and looking there. I understand why some of these were brought in. We all accept and understand that, but it does seem to be used as a bit of a smoke screen, I'm afraid, on some of these because they all appeared in the run-up in, in closing down on things and closing roads off because of COVID and active travel, and we now seem to be turning around and saying, oh, and there is that the hostile vehicle mitigation measures. So let's be clear, they shouldn't they shouldn't be a consideration about when we're opening or closing roads off for public transport and accessibility, because that is, it, it's almost a spurious link to put it in there. And, and forgive me making it sound, it's something that we all have to take seriously. And we've done some great work around Tudor Square, the station, and you can see the, the permanent measures that are in there. But these were things that were brought in to close off Surrey Street because of the active travel and closing off to getting through to Pinson Street. Let's not lump it in as the same thing and try to use it as a reason why. We've got to close off this. I have got other questions, Chair, but I, if I can come back after. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lodge. Councillor Johnson. Uh, I, I was going to say, there is quite a lot there. Yeah, yeah thanks, Councillor Lodge. Um, I'll just make three brief points, but I'm sure that Matt and Tom have got much more of the um, uh, officers' answers there. Just on footfall, though, I mean, people have been voting on the footfall's been recovering quite well, it seems, in the city centre from what our officers are telling us. And I think it's in the report that yeah, the recovery is actually doing marginally better than the UK average. Might not be what we feel, but objectively, that's apparently what the, the data is telling us, you know, so that is happening. Mm -hmm. With the, um, the, the government guidance on the loss of funding, I mean, this is an area where, frankly, it's new. That's the point I want to make, that it's, it's recent guidance and this is about you know the, the DFT responding to the fact that it's a national initiative to you know, provide quite a lot of money for improvements to um, active travel walking cycling and the public realm and that you know if councils take that money and then don't deliver on it then you know there, there will be you know suffer some consequences it's new it does reflect the sort of changing world that we're in there so that's an interesting point and then the other point was about sort of objective facts about uh, as against feelings, you know, and as I said, we, we, we get, um, you know, the idea that, you know, lots of people are telling us this or lots of people are telling us that. Um, I, I'm sure that Matt or Tom will have some figures on the you know, actual number of complaints or whatever. But I was just reflecting it because, I mean, you know, the petition, I think, to the question today was uh, telling us about how difficult it is to get off at Arundel Gate and come up um, Norfolk Street if you wanted to come in at the front entrance of the town hall. And pointing out that 
If you, take, you get off at the next stop, there's a much more gentle gradient, fairly limited, nothing there. And no doubt feels that that is you know, a longer journey, certainly a journey that's not used to. But if you recall, as Balsa told us, uh, when she brought the same petition to council the other day, that uh, she and her husband, um, I'm just using this example, you know, like to you know, get off at the, their old stop on Leopold Street where they used to, and then go down the moor, or on other days, down to Castle Gate and back. And the point is, and I can see why they want to do that, to get off there, go right down Vincent Street, down the moor. But actually, they are making that exact journey that, um, that they were talking about coming from the bus stop where they could get off now. So, with, with respect, Councillor Johnson, they're talking of getting off at the high point and going down to the low point. They're not talking of getting off and going up to the high point, up to uh, Orchard Square. They're talking of getting off Leopold Street and Orchard Square and going down to the lower point areas, which is a bit different if you're pushing or if you've got buggies or you're walking around and you've got mobility issues. And coming back. And, that, and that's the point. No, but I think, sorry, Chair, if I may, ways. because in the report it talks and it recognises that you get off a bus at one point and you get on to go back at another. And if you're getting off on Arundel Gate, you may be getting off there, uh, getting back on outside Pinson Street. But if you're getting off at Leopold Street or Pinson Street, you're getting back on at a lower location at Leopold's, at uh, Arundel Gate, or you're going to High Street. You're going down to the other, so you're going downhill. You're not having to walk uphill and back downhill. You were doing one way. Um, well, I don't think that's quite worked out because, of course, the people under the old system who would have to come in on Arundel Gate, um, but then would have to climb up to Leopold Street to get the return bus, they were in the same position but just in the opposite way where they had to. So someone's got to go uphill to some extent at some point, whoever they are. And that's the point. It's been reflected in the fact that there's, you know, to, to some extent. For the benefit of the public watching, that petitioner had a specific issue which you almost seem to be dismissing. And I was just trying to make the point, that petitioner has got a valid point and you were trying to dismiss it and saying it's not that same. They were always going to be doing that the other way. They were coming into a high point and going out on a low, low point. I accept other people have got different and other people experience it differently. But I was just making the point for that lady who came in and raised that specific question because she's not here to make that point again herself. Cool. No, I was just making the point that you know, there is still the issue about you know, objective evidence uh, as opposed to, to feeling. And the, the evidence we've heard today is that, that there are some winners and some losers. Um, and, and that's it. No bus service is designed around the needs of a single person. And so it's, what you have to look at is the aggregate of, um, you know, of people where they need to be. You know, so it's, I, I suppose it's to the point. I mean, it, it's always tempting on, on politicians to take the example of one person and to latch onto that as if they are representative of um, the, the wider population. Um, I'm sure we all do it, but we do it especially with disabled people. And it is one of the issues in disability politics that um, it is that, to some extent, exploitation of disabled people for other people's ends. And we've seen a lot, certainly with, um, you know, say, the motorist lobby. Again, we might be lumping all motorists into one category there. But um, the needs of disabled people are often portrayed in the aid of people who actually just want to drive about town. Um, and are not necessarily disabled themselves. So it's, it's why it is important, I think, to reflect on the objective data and the facts that we've got, um, that the work that's gone into these schemes and has been built up over a number of years. You look at things like the footfall figures. I guess that most people wouldn't expect Sheffield to doing better than average you know, on COVID recovery. But apparently that is what the data is telling us. I'll just come back on some of your other uh, questions, Councillor Lodge. Um, in terms of uh, consultation, um, the, the consultation uh, was undertaken uh, late uh, last, last year. Um, and we were really conscious uh, within developing the Transforming Sketchy Programme and the Connecting Sheffield projects within that, that clearly the pandemic was having a, a major influence on, on everybody's lives. And um, 
actually being able to, to, to launch a, a consultation that did reach out to as many people as possible. Um, we were conscious that we, we needed to design that in the right way and to try and launch that as well at the right time. So um, clearly there were various levels of lockdown periods um, in 2020. Um, we, we, we chose a time when much of the economy, economy sorry, was reopening. Um, in December last year, we felt that was an appropriate time to, to launch that consultation. The majority of that was um, online, um, and um, we, we, we kind of went into as many channels as we could to, to get that message out. There was also um, kind of literature sent to people within an area of the city centre. Uh, we also had specific engagement events as part of that, so live discussions with, with different groups of people. Um, and I think we tried to make that as full as an engaging experience as possible. Um, in normal times, I, I think you, you probably expect us to have kind of a stall in the Winter Gardens or um, you know, a, a room in, 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 this, in the town hall to have drop-in sessions and other things. That, that clearly wasn't possible, but I, I think you know, the response to the consultation was fairly significant. And you know, it, it did bring out comments from a range of people. Um, so so we, we do think that that was very useful in terms of further consultation or engagement. Then again, um, you know, that might form part of a, of a further discussion about some of the, the details of, of, of the scheme. Um, the, we, we don't have those numbers around how many people were, were shielding that we're trying to reach to or, or were responding to the consultation at that time. Um, that, that wasn't part of um, the, the consultation. Um, uh, the, the, the kind of equalities impact assessment and much of the discussion today has clearly been about those important issues. Um, you mentioned the, the, the EIA that has been published as part of the papers. Clearly that, that was from the uh, kind of the, the plan around Pinston Street, but also some of those uh, other emergency active it's the wider scheme of measures for social distancing. There is a, 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 a specific um, a EIA for the project, which again has been updated and developed through the, the process we've been going through. Um, it's been cognizant of the consultation feedback and some of the engagement that Matt and the team have had with um, uh, James and colleagues at Disability Sheffield, Transport for All and other groups. So that, that is being treated in that way as a live document, um, but there is a more specific and more full EIA for the project. Um, um, we're, we're not here in terms of kind of officers saying that, that, that we know best. What, what, we're, what we're trying to set out here is um, in terms of some of the kind of exemplar projects that, that Sheffield has really led the way on, such as Greater Green, and um, that have been recognized beyond Sheffield as, as, as being as such. Um, we, we wanted to take some of the, the ethos around that scheme and to weave that through the city center. Um, kind of active travel is clearly a key part of that, kind of providing high quality segregated cycle space um, that, that's clear to everybody around it um, is really important. And that builds on the reach of uh, the scheme that we did close to HSBC on Charter Road to bring that right into the centre. Having clear, consistent, coherent cycling routes is the only way that we're really going to make those attractive for, for people that aren't cycling now. And that's the real focus. But, but I think sometimes, you know, the, the kind of public realm, um, some of the active travel elements of the scheme do sometimes, and there's significant amounts of those within the project, 13,000 square meters of public realm enhancement, significant planting, landscaping, sustainable journeys, all, all of those things, positive for, for biodiversity, climate, uh, climate, climate emergency response. Some of the things that do get a bit lost are the benefits arising from our proposals and within the Connecting Sheffield Scheme for public transport. Matt mentioned some of those earlier, but, but in, in terms of the movement of um, the route through Pinston Street, what we're, what we're trying to create is a far more coherent, clear route through the city centre 
backed up with high levels of public transport priority. Um, and that will have an implication in terms of some of the access for, uh, you know, for where somebody wants to come into the city centre that might not be on a bus. Um, but it's really important to improve those journey times because we were facing significant delays for routes through the city centre. Some of those routes were circuitous. Having Finston Street as a one-way street does mean that the, the, the coherence between where you get on and off um, is an issue. But that's not to, to say that the, the issues that have been raised today in terms of access that we're not aware of and that we're not considering. They're really important issues. And, and they're really important issues. I think this is highlighted. They're really important issues for some of those people that do get off the bus on Arundel Gate now and used to before. So there are a number of services. There were 36 that moved off Finston Street onto Arundel Gate and other parts of the city. But there were a lot of buses that, that did stop and drop people off on their route into town on Arundel Gate. And those people will have been facing those routes up to the town hall if they're coming here or to, to, to the city hall or wherever that might be. And I think some of those act wider access accessibility issues that we're potentially going to be able to address as part of the scheme and looking at the detail of those is going to be really important. And, and that is part of our ongoing development of the project. Um, hostile vehicle met mitigation. I, I think the, the, the key issue there for us is that, um, you know, in terms of um, that issue, there, there is an issue there that in terms of protecting space that high levels of people will be in is very important. You know, I think we probably all wish it wasn't the case, but, but it, it is. Um, the, the, the measures that went in immediately um, at the time that we were delivering uh, the, the emergency active travel measures um, effectively were to quickly make sure that space that more people might be in, queuing outside of banks that's been mentioned, or shops, um, was protected as much as it could be. Um, again, we, we didn't have a full picture of what that would look like in terms of a response to the pandemic, but given that the, the, the kind of clear push was to make sure that space was available for people and that it was as safe as possible, I, I think in terms of the, the, the reason why those measures went in, hopefully you can understand why they did. But we have got um, other spaces that have been identified in the city centre that, that greater levels of protection is going to be important. You mentioned Tudor Square, um, which is again another one of the great facilities in, in Sheffield city centre. Making sure that's safe for events, for people, for going to the theatres is really important. And we've, we've introduced permanent counter-terrorism measures there. And we want to make those look, uh, you know, as good as they can be. The, the scheme for transforming cities was trying to almost avoid um, uh, the, the, the requirement to almost protect with heavy infrastructure, uh, whether that's around the Peace Gardens or other locations, by effectively designing out some of the, the, the routes through those areas. So actually, at the points where we're making those changes and the roads would be closed, those are, the, the, those are the points where we need to make sure that protection is appropriate and that avoids some of the more heavier infrastructure, whether it's down the side of the Peace Gardens on Finston Street or, or some of the other locations. Um, it, it is part of the design and we're trying to make that as minimal as possible because when we're creating those spaces for people to be in and we want more people to be on, in those spaces, that's one of the key objectives, is we want them to be safe. Just finally, Council Lodge, because I think we might have covered everything, but you did ask a lot of questions. In terms of the, the difference in levels, we can provide that. So as part of the accessibility work we did, we followed the, the inclusive mobility standards, which means that every metre up, you times it by 10, and that's why you get those figures. So we, we have measured it on a vertical and a horizontal basis. So I would give you them now, but it, are they in the... All right, well, th those... Yeah, those figures are in the report. I can't access the network, so I can't give you it right now. If, if I may, Chair, I have got some other questions, but I'm, I'm sure these other colleagues want to go in, so if I can come back afterwards. Sorry, Councillor Rooney. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just first one to comment, really. I'm not sure that it's uh, 
particularly justified to say that the foot, increase in footfall is down to the, the measures that you've introduced. I think there's an element of um, when the um, COVID restrictions were lifted and an element of, shall we say, retail therapy as well involved in that. So I think that's not really a fair argument. Um, can I ask, uh, do you know how many people, how many Sheffielders regard themselves as having a disability? We do have that, but it's on a report which, which I can't access. So Councillor Rooney okay. can provide that afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, it also says that at 1.3 that 36 bus routes have been changed. Has anybody spoken to the bus users of those 36 routes since the changes were made and what they think about it? No? Yes? No? Maybe? So in terms of the consultation, Councillor Rooney, we, we tried to make it as, as broad and as range as possible. Uh, we, we targeted into bus users where we could, so we used the, the bus operators actually carried a lot of those messages through their communication channels, so we tried to reach as, as many as possible. Um, so I can only assume that we have done, because that was the levels of, of comms which we went through to try and target those, uh, those segments. So you're assuming that people are being asked well, the, 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 there wasn't There wasn't a specific question which said, are you a bus user or not? So that means that we can't determine whether they were a bus user or not when the no, results I, came in. If, if I may, I mean, on two or three occasions as a bus user, I don't drive. Uh, I have had people from what was the PTE come and ask me, get on my bus service and ask me what I thought of it. So that's what I'm, that's the sort of thing I'm on about. It's those 36 routes that have been changed and someone actually get on that bus and ask the people what they think about the changes. Has anybody done that? We haven't undertaken that task specifically. I think you should have. I think you should have, and then you might get uh, some sort of idea of what people think about the changes you've made. Um, and uh, I, I've got a number of questions, but the, 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 the last, I'll, I'll keep, it, um, keep it fairly brief. I mean, I, I genuinely, don't understand why you're you prepared it sounds to envisage the idea of a, a bus going along Leopold Street and then round Barker's Pool and then along I think you said cross Burgess Street or Burgess Street but not down Pinstone and I, 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 I don't understand that and did you say that the potential access to uh, by taxis and deliveries, lorries, uh, is being thought about uh, on Pinstone Street. I would have thought that if, I mean, we all knew that they were going to build the hotel, it's, most of it's there now. So why didn't you include that in the original plans when you were talking about putting these measures on Pinstone Street? Fairly obvious thing to do to me. So servicing requirements have been included within the design of the project. So the, the servicing needs of the hotel have been included in both the emergency work. Uh, just bear in mind that anyone can access at the moment. They just need to call city centre management team. They can open the gates up. So that can be sorted right now. That is not precluded as it currently stands. And in the future proposal, the, the orange route on the plan, which you'll see in figure three or whatever it was, also matches up as a servicing route. So the servicing requirements of all the businesses on Pinston Street, either the lower bit or the upper bit, have been included, as well as their way out of the city centre as well. And that's the same for future high street funds. So it absolutely has been considered. We can't do a transport scheme without understanding the requirements of the people who, the people who require the... Um, this, this lost my train of thought now. Uh, the, 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 I can understand the, the, why. The, uh, the, the businesses that, uh, that require the access, obviously, that's all part of it. In terms of the route, Councillor Rooney, I think I might have, you know, maybe it was confusing, but Pinson Street would be served in some way or another, but Pinson Street, that lower bit, so you know where, um, where the new heart of the city block would be, yeah. the, 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 the bus would obviously have to somehow get to cross Burgess Street, Burgess Street, and it, it would go Furnival Gate through that bit of Pinson Street somewhere. But that's all matter of detail, which we're not quite established yet, because it's early, early times in, in that routine. Would, would you mind indulging me one more question, Chair? Um, 
You see, I, the, the other thing I find very difficult to believe is that if you went to the government and said, uh, we've had a slight rethink about what we want to do. We actually want to send a, a non-polluting bus service through this area. Uh, are you seriously saying, because we think it's uh, more, it's fairer and it would allow disabled people uh, better access, that they would say, go away, we're not listening to you. Do you think they would really do that? I, I, I'll just comment on, on that one, if that's okay. So I, I think in terms of the, the, the 36 routes and the numbers of buses that we're serving um, those routes now and, and, and before the pandemic and before the change, I think that we're not in a position here today to be able to say with, with confidence that those buses would become zero emission. Um, we're doing a lot of really positive work with bus operators to, um, to, to improve the emissions of their buses. We've secured funding from government through Clean Bus Technology Fund, but that is to upgrade them to a Euro 6 um, equivalent standard, which um, for the emissions um, is a significant improvement, but they wouldn't be um, zero emission. In terms of- With respect, uh, you're, answer, you're answering a question I didn't ask. What I said was, did you, did you actually go and talk to the people that use those bus services and I what they think about the changes? Did say anything about them being uh, car, um, carbon free, new, neutral or whatever? That was the question I asked. Sorry, I was, I was answering the last one that you posed, which was around would, would government say no to allowing us to, to route zero uh, electric buses along Kingston Street? Um, in terms of asking bus users, Matt, Matt's answered that question. Um, that wasn't done, and I, I outlined when the consultation was done, which was December 2020, and at that point, um, there were still significant social distancing measures in place, and I, I, I'm, I'm certain that it would not have been positive to hold face-to-face -face, um, discussions on bus, on a bus user survey. Um, that's not to say that that isn't a valid exercise in, in non-COVID times or, or when we're dealing with the pandemic and social distancing. Um, did, I, I don't think we've answered your question either, Councillor Rooney, on um, footfall and the change. And, and again, no, we're not saying that the, um, kind of the, 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 the positive signs in terms of footfall in the city centre are solely related to the changes on Kingston Street. What, what we're saying is that um, that, is, that is just the trend but the other, the other trend there is that, um, you know, I think our, the index is, is 57 um, out of, you know, 100 plus. With, with that return to footfall in the city centre, the trend is that large cities like Sheffield are suffering in terms of footfall more than other places because predominantly... Um, around the issue of the higher levels of office accommodation and city centre working. Um, that, that is a national trend again, and that's, that's followed through in terms of public transport as well, not just footfall, um, because at the moment we are around 60-65% of pre-COVID patronage, um, which again is a significant issue and um, related to um, the, the type of uses that are in the city centre. Just a couple of things to clarify. Um, as Tom said, that the, um, the, the on sorry on the buses actually it's not what Tom said. The bus users were consulted, and the point was that there was a substantial full public consultation that went on for two or three months over well certainly December and January last year. It, 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 it was a full um, public consultation that was fairly well publicised. And, and of course, as you know, the results of that was that there was you know, a very strong majority in favour of people who liked the, the scheme there. And, and I think bus users, bus users obviously were, were um, feeding into that. Um, you know, many people um, benefited from it. Obviously, there would have been you know, some negative comments in there too. The, on, the, on the wider point, actually, there is an interesting point about um, consulting bus users because um, very recently we had this issue about the um, bus service improvement plan and the need for people to be consulted. And I, I know that we were lobbied by 
lots of people. I had sort of, it's over 200 emails in from me, people individually, um, saying that actually there should be more consultation with um, bus users on all the stuff around you know, improvements um, to do with the, uh, the transport executive. Um, there the used to be mechanisms for better um, bus user consultation, and you know, but also they're not ours. They're not so a council function. It's a transport executive, and they've you know largely fallen by the wayside there. So there's certainly you know a vocal body of bus users um, who you know are there to you know put forward their ideas, and it can only seem that you know they you know would have had every chance to put into the consultation, and you know I guess their um, their views would have been useful. On the retail, yes, the first question you asked, I think, was, um, yeah, you, you, we're not saying that, um, that the figures show there's a correlation between, you know, the buses changing and, you know, the, the amount of footfall on businesses. We're actually just saying there's no link at all. And I think everyone's had a, a letter from Paul Turpin, who's been working with um, officers um, on, on this issue about increasing footfall and supporting businesses to recover. But, you know, frankly, you know, whether you have buses on Vincent Street or not is it, just irrelevant to that. It doesn't, it doesn't feature at all, really. I think that's the point that they uh, want to get across. Yeah, in other words, it's, it quite neatly rebuts the, uh, the sort of notion that you know, any change to buses is killing business or whatever. It, it just doesn't stack up. Thank you. Um, just a point there, I was just, it's occurred to me that if we, why don't we advertise on the buses for when they, yeah, while yeah. people are travelling and I'm sure we'll get some texts through. Councillor Aries. Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of questions. Um, and um, it, it, it follows on from the, um, around the subject of, of consultation, but uh, my question is around um, consultation with the, uh, the, the blue light services and um, I hear what you say um, about the, um, uh, the, the, the remarks about hostile vehicle mitigation measures. However, my questions come um, as, uh, as a member of the um, uh, South Yorkshire Fire and, Authority, uh, Fire and Rescue Authority as a council appointed member. Um, and just for the benefit of mainly members of the public, so councillors may generally know that um, the, the fire authority agonised for months on end uh, when it was putting together the, the integrated risk management plan. And two key areas um, that feature in the, um, the IRMP that was signed off about, about just a year ago are the services, first of all, the services building risk review following Grenfell and response times. And they're broken up within the IRMP to call handling, turnout time and travel time. And people may, may not be aware that um, the South Yorkshire Fire and Rescue uh, in July published a list of high rise residential buildings forming part of its building risk review project of the post Grenfell. So across the whole of the county, South Yorkshire, there are 232 on this list, uh, high risk, um, high rise buildings. Of those 232, 210, that's 90% are in the Sheffield area. And 79, that's one third of the county's total are in the S1 postcode area. So my questions are, and in two parts, what consultation has been or will be carried out with the fire, police and ambulance services on the temporary closure? What have been their comments to date? What consultation has been or will be carried out with the fire, police and ambulance services on the more permanent proposals? And what have been their comments to date? And I will. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, thanks, Councillor. Um, so, the Fire, Police and Ambulance Service are statutory council teams with any traffic regulation order. C Chair, can, can, I, can I just contradict that? Because, because I, I, I have a response from, from the, the Fire Service, because I asked these questions. And, and um, the short answer to, the, to, to that question is they cannot find any consultation 
and as a result have not contributed any comments. Can, can I just wonder in why as a statutory consultee they haven't been consulted? Can I have clarity on who that emails come from please and we can recover it that way they've got all the information that we've got? It's from the Assistant Chief Fire Officer. Okay, and well, we'll, we'll, copy out of yeah, we'll, we'll look into that then um, because that is obviously a, a matter of clarity for the Agent 1. Um, in terms of the, the, the future operation, um, they were consulted on the proposed plans um, and I think actually when you look at what we're trying to do in the city centre, we're actually trying to remove traffic from those key areas. So you could argue, you know, with common sense to say that they can actually get there quicker, less impeded. Uh, but in, but as, as you will probably know, is that under any blue light circumstances, uh, their special privilege was given to moving traffic, etc. cetera. Um, but we will, you know, part of the detailed design and the, um, you know, the future traffic regulations which are going with the permanent scheme uh, will obviously have engagement with those statutory consultees of which those you've mentioned will be part of it. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll forward a copy of the, 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 the email um, from the Assistant Chief Fire Officer where they, they maintain they've done a thorough search of their um, Resilience Planning Contingencies Department have done a thorough search and they, they've not um, received any information on the Leopold Pinston Street closures that I referred to. So. I'll, I'll forward that email to you. Um, I have a more parochial question, which is about um, we, we talk on, on the bus services. Um, one of one of the um, longest routes, um, and this is more. Uh, I, I confess this is a parochial question because because it, it's, it, it extends from um, High Green to Jordan Thorpe and Hurdings, are the service one and one A. And you can imagine that the distance, because we, um, we've had representations, and I don't know whether Councillor Shaw might have, want to add to what I've had said, um, that um, we've had representations from um, local residents, um, you know, because, because of the length of the journeys that, 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 uh, that, that people have to make in, in either direction on, on those routes. Uh, the two routes which come through the city centre, um, we, we've had strong representations from, from on, particularly on, on the number one one A routes um, about the, um, the the difficulties that, that they face having once they get off in the city centre access to, to toilets um, and. The subject that we've been discussing, of, of course, is getting on, on to getting onto a, a further bus to get to where they want to, to get. I guess that's more of a comment rather than a question. So I won't I, I won't anticipate a response from that. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Dale. Thank you, Chair. I don't know where to begin, actually, because I started off with one list and now I've got a completely different list of questions and comments. I think starting off with the, the Oxford Street comment, as, as uh, Councillor Lodge said, we're not London. We don't have the travel infrastructure and London have the tube. So if you want to get from one side of uh, London to another or from, as I did, from Regent Street to Oxford Street, which is literally like that, jumped on a tube when you didn't really know London. So wherever you go in London, you can find your way through public transport. And it's flat. It's not, can I just finish before you respond? Is that all right? Thank you. So, you know, London's flat, Sheffield's not, okay? I think no one has actually suggested, and I think we need to be very mindful, nobody has suggested anywhere that we open up Sheffield City Centre to dirty cars and dirty buses. No one suggested that, and I think our language needs to be really mindful of that. I think what people are asking is to, for a very well thought out public transport system. And one of those options would be to open up Leopold and Pinston Street to an electric vehicle, which would get people from one side of the city to, to another. Myself being someone who chosen not to drive for, for all the right reasons and does use public transport and walks far, the city centre plan for me will be fabulous. It will be great. There'll be lots of things I'd like to come and do. I'm physically able. I'm really supportive of regreening the city and the green corridor. 
But for the people that I represent, that is not the case. And I think the comments about people who are, what, I'm, what people out there will have seen today and what people have approached me have said, if they disagree or if they come with an issue that they've just got feelings and their feelings are just going to get hurt and they're just being upset, is not the case. This is democracy and people should be allowed to come into this chamber with their point of view and their experiences and not be dismissed. So I just think, I just wanted to get that out there. I think as we've, as we've gone on today, I've become less confident that this has been well thought through. I feel less confident that enough consultation has gone on and I feel less confident about the consultation around the public and public transport plan. Because what I keep hearing is we're still considering that and we're still thinking about that. So for members of the public who have come back into Sheffield City Centre after a lockdown and found that they can't get to certain places and their bus routes have changed. You know, I have experience of a family member who's severely ill who don't get out very often, fancied a trip into the city centre, found out that the bus started, kind of, you know what Mucky Duck used to be? The bus stops there and then she'd had to walk all the way up. This is my mother-in-law who's seriously ill and it completely did her in for a week. Um, and, and it's just, the messaging is not clear. I feel that if we got the messaging, if you're talking about having a bus that would run to end of Leopold Street, it's literally on Pinkstone Street. It's at the top of Fargate. People could get, like we were saying, down Fargate and down the moor. But that's not clear. Or is that not planned yet? Is that just an idea? It just I don't know if I'm making any sense because there's so much to cover. It just doesn't all feel connected enough. There are so many plans for one space to the general public, for us as, as members, it's difficult to track it down. To the general public, it is very difficult to understand why we are doing what we are doing to the city centre. And I think from, from my perspective, from the conversations that I've had, we're creating a beautiful village in the city centre. And I don't know if that's what members of the public that don't live in the city centre expect from their city centre. So what are we talking about when we talk about um, bringing in new business, bringing in new high street, what, what market testing has been done for large retailers that might want to come, because we're losing them hand over fist, what conversations have been had about what it is they're looking for when they move into a city centre? What sort of infrastructure do they want? That's all for now, thank you. Just to come in on, on the sort of outline of that, though, I mean, I think actually that's some, some really good points. So you were asking the same question I started off with, is what do we want our city centre to be like and what do we want it to feel like? Uh, and obviously we need to have it, you know, accessible for, for everyone. Uh, and I think, what, so one of the um, one of the drives at the moment is, you know, um, all the executive members and the, the, the senior management and the council has, uh, you know, been looking at the fact that actually, yes, there are all these different projects. There's some big, big initiatives going off. And the, the question is how to dovetail them. And I think that's right. So um, it is a work in progress at the moment to actually have a coherent uh, city centre plan. And it incorporates uh, all stuff around you know, part in the parts of the city, you know, this, the Transforming uh, Cities Fund and the Connecting Sheffield work, the Future High Streets Fund, which is separate again. Um, but also things like, you know, the, the bus service improvement plan, which we haven't, which is, you know, a function of the transport executive and the region. We're having to sort of work with them on that. Bring all those things together. At the same time, there's, you know, also issues around, um, and the, the point I made is this needs to cover things like antisocial behaviour and, and begging in the city centre, um, because those all affect people's experiences there. There's the issue about green space and open space. We mentioned Pounds Park before. Um, there's a continual theme of that. And then at the moment, I mean, there's, there's disruption in the city centre with um, the building the next um, Greater Green bit that's, that's ongoing when you've just come in um, off Angel Street, just further up from uh, Snake Hill, where, where you're talking about. So there's a need to have that as a coherent plan. And, and you know, as I said before, people say, you know, Sheffield looks like a building site. It literally is, you know. But, you know, given that that's where we are, it's not a time to be stalling the work, if you like, and not a time to be abandoning it and deciding that we, we don't want to build this 
all after all. Um, the other thing with Heart of the City is, uh, and this is the interesting thing I was um, on the other day, is that um, there's a lot of building work going on. Um, there's actually a lot of businesses that are, I think have signed up for lets and tenancies and, you know, be moving in there. And probably in the relatively near future, because a lot of those buildings are simultaneously coming on to completion, as far as I can tell. Um, so, actually, you know, businesses are coming in there. Um, yeah, we've, we've got to work out how that fits together. But that city centre plan is a work in progress, and as a chief executive scheme, that you know we all work on that in a in a coherent way. So yeah, it is ongoing. Thank you, Douglas. And I think we know that mm. because we're in the know of that. But the general public don't know that, and they just see yeah. bits of work happening across the city. We've known for 12 to 15 years that we've got a plan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's not new. Things have been happening, and you know, cranes have been in city, then they've left, and then they've come back. We get that, but how do we get the messaging out to members of the public, and and not assuming that people know what the vision is for the city, not assuming that how do we make people feel included in that process, rather than having to come to something like a scrutiny committee or a full council or come into the town hall, or come into the market. You know, we've got communities beyond the city centre. You know, we've got Shire Green, we've got Firth Park, we've got High Green. You know, people out there want to know what is happening. In, we are a core city, and our, our citizens should understand and know what it is we're doing. And then we would probably be able to prevent a lot of these meetings where we sit here for hours on end, you know, and us having to, having to ask questions. And I don't know if we're ever going to resolve that because it's a big city and I know not everyone's always going to get the information. But I just think, like you said, Douglas, we've got lots and lots of plans. Mm. It doesn't feel connected and it doesn't feel cohesive. I, I mean, I'm in complete agreement with you, Dawn. I mean, it, it actually doesn't. And, and, and there is a real difficulty about getting that across the public. I mean, um, you know, I've often been you know, critical of the council for failing to do that. To be fair, it is quite a hard job. Um, Partly because actually it's quite difficult to explain to ourselves how all these things fit together. The, the other um, disadvantage we've suffered is that actually because this has been a bit of a you know political debate, um, it's kind of held things up a bit. So you know it's why, for instance, you know we've still got all those plastic barriers and the, and concrete blocks that could have been covered with artwork but haven't because you know things have just kind of stalled. Um, and I think that yeah we do have a lot of bosses in the council who are working on some quite good stuff. And I think we should let them get on with it, really. Um, so I just want to say that. I mean, it, it is encouraging. But, yeah, we could certainly do more work still on, on the comms. And actually, one of the, one of the suggestions was um, that, you know, the, you know, the fact that we've actually got so many hoardings in the middle of the city now um, is actually a really good opportunity to showcase some of what it could look like. And the, the power of publicity about it being in situ, if you like, has worked really well. If you look at the Greater Green, that's worked really well because there's quite a lot of sort of explainers on that. It's in, people can physically see it, but by being there, and you know, people go there just to enjoy it, they can sort of read the signage, read the explanations, and people get that understanding of how they fit together um, and what the purpose of it is because there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. And, yeah, we could do that. It is actually fairly new. I know you said it'd be on going for 12 years or so. But actually, there's a real drive now. And to be fair, the, the new chief exec who's come in, you know, only this year, um, has been really pushing the need for a coherent, single idea of what's happening at the city centre. And I think there is a lot we can work on there. Yeah, I, I think it's quite encouraging, really, to think what can be done. So I've lost track of other questions and probably... Um, um, oh, sorry. Me. Um, if, if you don't mind, just interject on that point. Um, th there's, there's a few things on the wider city centre that, that, that is planned. One is um, a, a coherent um, document, a coherent proposal that, that explains to, to us all and to, to, to the wider um, public of things that are happening now in the city centre um, leading up to a, uh, towards the end of the year, a broader consultation on longer term plans for the city centre and, and the wider central area. So it, it is a point that's recognised as something short term that will be put in place and then a much wider consultation leading to a, a revised longer term plan um, by the turn of the year. So hopefully that will answer the question. Okay, thanks loads, Dale.
can I just make one final comment? Which is just, I think representing people who don't agree with policy is not necessarily a makes it, making it political. You know, we are elected to represent everyone and not everyone agrees with this. So I wouldn't want to think that just by, you know, me sitting here and representing people that have come to me and said we're unhappy about it or we're anxious and we don't understand what's going on, doesn't make that political. That makes it us doing our jobs and representing people that need representing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Argentio. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Matt and Tom, uh, for the report. Um, I've made lots of no notes and thank you, um, Dawn, for that. Um, I'm going to use one of your images. Um, you said we make, we're make building a village in the city centre. Um, and I think that is actually a really good image uh, because the city centre should be a village because there are 22,000 people living in the city centre. So we've, we've got to remember that the city centre is not just for people to come into a busy city centre for doing whatever they want or need to do, but it's also a place where people live and work. So we have to make it okay for everybody and it's really difficult to juggle all of those um, things and we've heard from re representation from the city centre residents who are very happy with the measures as they are. Uh, I have a different experience in terms of people who've contacted me, especially in the last 10 days, knowing that this was going on. Uh, I stopped counting um, on Tuesday night how many emails I've had and I think I had 14 at that point. None of them were against the, the scheme as it is at the moment. Uh, I haven't had time to check my councillor emails yesterday and today because I was at work, uh, but I know that there are more waiting for me that I know will be supported. However, um, my question is about what mitigation can we actually put in place? Um, I am um, an advocate for disability. I work for a disability charity for five years, so I, it's always on, on my radar. And I think that what I would do if I had someone like is it Mrs. Lennox, who, yeah, who came, who came in, I would um, try to advise her how to find a way around getting a different kind of wheelchair, maybe, which we could have, you know, if we had the shopability um, service still, we could maybe support those residents that have got like practical difficulties. Uh, in that way because disability is a spectrum, it's a really, really wide spectrum. So whilst we may change something and really please someone like the gentleman that we, we heard, then you are going to upset someone else. There isn't a solution that will make everybody absolutely happy. So we need to find a way of mitigating uh, the problems that we create <coughs> whilst we're trying to make the city centre more accessible uh, to everybody, including disabled people um, and also in terms of um, the village uh, I grew up in a completely different country although I've lived in this country for longer than I lived in my uh, native country and cities are completely different in my country cities are where people live uh, and where you have the corner shop and the bakery in the middle of the city and this is what is missing in the city centre. I think we've got to get away from the idea that we will get the large retailers back in the city centre. Those days have gone, and that is a trend that has been going on for years. It's not, it's not just because of COVID. In fact, it might not have to do anything with COVID. So we've got to make it appealing so that more people want to live in the city centre, more people want to come back and work in the city centre, and so that the smaller retailer can really flourish so that's we've got to change our mindset because if we still think with with a brain that was all you know with ideas that were okay 30 years ago we're not going to get anywhere things have changed people have changed their habits people shop online all the big retailers um you know it's not just sheffield it's, it's in the core cities so we have to change our mindset um, so for me it's more about um you know, what can we do to support people with disabilities um, that we are not at the moment um, serving, if you want. And I do agree with Dale about communication. I think it's very important that when we put things in place that we have a really good campaign of communication, 
if there are changes to transport or to lay layout, because for disabled people, it makes massive difference. Um, and in terms of the what's happening as a plan, um, it's just popped in my head. Could we have like uh, some visuals, you know, stuck to all these building sites where we show what the city centre is going to look like? So that have big billboards that says this is what's going to happen, maybe with timelines as well. So to make it really colourful, and I know that is not going to, you know, it's not going to be accessible to people with a visual impairment, but maybe we can have some that are, you know, um, digital and with um, screen readers so that people can have access to it that way. So I know that the chief executive is very, very keen on communication, but it might be a way to, you know, because a report is not accessible for everybody. People don't want to read 10 page, 20 page, 30 page report, but something that is like there and visual might be a good way to tell people what's happening and what's going to happen. Thank you, Councillor Argenti. And I don't think there were many questions there, just there maybe about the billboard. Um, Councillor Phipps, would you like to come in? Thank you. Um, so as a council, we've committed to addressing the climate emergency. If the Transforming Cities Fund was theoretically to be lost due to a reversal of the Pinson Street closure or was otherwise not progressed, could we meet the Arup key recommendation around building an improved active travel and public transport network? I think it was referred to as revolutionized transport patterns to deliver the carbon reductions necessary for the 2030 council target. And similarly, if these schemes were lost, do we know of another opportunity like this to progress so many accessibility improvements in the center and more widely? Um, I've got a couple more if that's okay. Um, so linking to this, the, to the ARC report, uh, the ARC report emphasize the health benefits of improving active travel infrastructure. Is the committee aware that health professionals have written into the council, transport officers should be able to confirm this, um, in support of the Pinson Street closure on health grounds, as well as climate crisis grounds, and that there is now a petition started yesterday by health professionals, already at over 300 signatures to keep Pinson Street closed to motor traffic. Um, just one more. Um, what is the balance of positive feedback to negative on the scheme so far? Thank you. Chair, can I just, can I just ask you, because the first question that Councillor Phipps said there was a bit of a supposition, because I asked, is there a risk, if we got a risk assessment on this funding not coming through, and we haven't got a risk assessment, and it's new, new sort of things that's come out. So it's, again, it's another supposition that if this is there, so, it, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to understand what this impact is. But if we're making suppositions, I could turn around and say, you know, I, I think electric buses running down there would improve air quality and we don't need a, a clean air zone. But that's my view, my supposition, because there's no evidence to back that up. So I'll, I'm just a bit confused. If we haven't got an act, uh, if we haven't got a risk assessment on this, where is it coming from that we're saying these funds are at risk? Um, I, I, I can add some background to why I'm asking this question if, if councillors are not already aware. Um, so I'm asking this question because in Brighton, an um, active travel measure paid for under the emergency active travel of a bicycle lane was introduced during the pandemic. It was then removed following a committee meeting voting to remove it. And since then, Brighton had transport funding can't, I think it's all transport funding, but it possibly might be active travel, but I think it's all transport funding halted for pending discussions. And a letter from the government specifically says for measures that are active travel measures that are regressed in this manner that will affect future funding bids. So that is the basis for my question. I've said if transforming cities fund were to be lost, I'm saying it's at risk. We don't know if it would or would not be, but I think it's fair that in this committee we do consider the impacts a decision, a recommendation we could make then lead to. Because if we don't consider that, then what are we doing? Would you like to answer that? Uh, thank you. Um, I think the, the letter that you referred to is, is a letter that all local authorities have received. Um, and that came through um, earlier this summer in, in July from the Minister of State for Transport. 
it, it was a it was a letter um, that was specifically in relation to the active travel measures um, that uh, were funded through the emergency active travel fund, but also kind of made reference to broader transport funding. Um, it it was particularly highlighting premature removal of schemes carrying implications for the management of the public money use in these schemes and for the government's future relation, fun, funding could, relationship with could the Could I just get clarity there? Um, so the stuff that we've already removed on uh, Gibraltar Street, what's the implication of that? Because we've already taken a choice to remove one of them. Does that, is that covered by this as well? So, yeah. so in terms of, in terms of the, the letter, it is related to the emergency active travel funding that is included within this. In terms of, for example, the Shells Moor scheme, um, we introduced that scheme uh, with, with that funding. Um, we did retain parts of that scheme um, with the low traffic neighbourhood in Kellam, and we had uh, feedback, which is one of the, the decision kind of points in this. It, it, it's talking about engagement, not rushing to remove. Um, and we had a process of engagement for that scheme, which led to the retention of the LTN in Kellam as kind of the, the preferred route for cycling parallel to, to the ring road. Um, and again, that now forms part of that, that kind of evidence base that's leading into the delivery of transforming cities funded connection from the city center to Kellam to Neapsen, which you'll be familiar with. So, in terms of risks around funding, there are clearly kind of um, a government position around wanting to be certain that we're using the funding that we receive in the right way and that we are giving enough time for those schemes to have effect and for that to be in our considerations in terms of any further decision on, on their future. Um, if we're not doing that, then there are risks associated with it. And, you know, those risks kind of are as they've set out in the letter. It could affect future funding. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, in, in terms of the scheme that we've been developing, developing to bring forward, clearly there's, that is a scheme. It's fun, there, are, there is funding available within a program. Um, and, you know, there are risks associated with being able to deliver within timescales associated with the funds and the program associated with that. So there are a number of risks associated with projects developing decision points. Um, and you know, w where we are at the moment is that, yes, there is a broader position here. We're not too sure what the, the, the actual financial position in Brighton is, um, if we're honest. Um, but there is clearly kind of, you know, there's been press and publicity about the potential implications of that. I think, that's we're, that's I think we're moving to into the realms of active travel here. I just want us to get back to Pinstone Street because that's going to be another subject for this uh, committee. So well, could we get back to... Well, there, there is a specific calling. assurance I can give because actually Mark raises a, a sensible question. Does the removal of, say, the Shalesmore scheme put our uh, funding at risk? And the, the reason I say no is because the specific um, guidance we're talking to is the one called um, gear change. Um, and... So that's um, the gear change active transport strategy. Um, Tom's referred to the, the formal covering letter that comes with it. But this guidance was published in um, February of this year, by the January February, I think it was February. So the point is, it takes effect from that date. The, the removal of the shells more predated that. So in terms of you know, public law administration, the government couldn't really claw back something because of a retrospective action. But now this is in place, um, it's obviously a serious threat. The other thing that um, Tom hasn't mentioned is, of course, because all our funding for um, transport goes through the region, there are a lot of discussions with the region and about how the region has its um, dialogue with the DFT. All this funding is now being channeled through that. And the, the risk is, the, the risk is twofold. So one is the risk of what will government do, but also what will the region do? Because it would look really bad, in other words, and going back to the whole question about credibility of Sheffield City Council, if we had a complete reversal of what we're proposing to do, 
that then had a negative effect on the impression of on uh, the Sheffield City region. Um, they wouldn't be too chuffed with us, in other words. And that would probably damage um, you know, our standing when it comes to dealing with all the other um, really substantial amounts of funding that are coming in for lots and lots of transport schemes, you know, right, uh, substantially right across South Yorkshire. So that's the risk there. It's a risk because at the moment it's new and it's really hard to quantify. Okay, thank you. Councillor Shaw. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got, well, I'll try to keep it brief. I've got about four or five questions and a bit of a comment, but I'll, I'll try to uh, crack through it in the uh, interest of, of time. Um, can I just say uh, at the outset, um, I'm a carer for someone who's dependent on a, on a wheelchair and public transport to, to, to get about. So I fully uh, sympathise with the points that have been raised and um, you know the issues raised by the uh, uh, by the question um, by the petitioners and the and, and, and the uh, questioners, especially um, the points from uh, Martha and, and James uh, earlier about um, disabled people and their experiences are not a they're not a, a, a monolith and accessibility issues in the city centre. Um, aren't limited to Kinston Street and didn't begin with um, Kinston Street. Um, you know, for instance, the, the lack of a ramp at Esperanto Place is, you know, in my view, particularly egregious given how recently those steps have just gone in. So my first uh, first question about um, about the uh, footfall figures and uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> can I be? <laughs> Um, about the uh, football figures, uh, footfall figures. Um, so, for the um, accounting for the um, like changes in footfall and the decrease, has there been any um, accounting for how the changes are due to uh, due to COVID restrictions and, and pandemic, in which we're still in? Um, the changes on uh, Pinston Street, uh, the closure of uh, Debenhams and, and John Lewis, um, which. <laughs> Will probably have had a, an, an impact, and also the changes of um, businesses working from home. I know a lot of a lot of businesses, especially tech-based businesses based in the city centre, are now working uh, working from home more or completely, uh, which would affect weekday footfall. Has any measure been taken of of those of um, of, of of those changes, um, and then? Secondly, has there been any um, demographic data gathered on on footfall um, to see if, um, for instance, there's been like a, an increase in yeah, young people and families, or you know, versus like older people or people with um, you know perhaps you know mobility issues, um, to see if that's had a, a, a differential um, effect on those. Um, and then my next couple of questions are relating to. Um, uh, Changes affecting uh, like other schemes, such as Connecting Sheffield, which have been large, largely covered already. Um, yeah, I'm particularly concerned about possible impacts on, um, you know, uh, projects like the Ship Valley route, or for instance, which affects uh, South City, and also the, the new recent bids um, for for funding for for Atticliffe and the um, Advanced Manufacturing Park. Whether um, any changes might have, you know, an adverse uh, favorability on on those getting funding for that so, but you know so that's been covered a lot um, already um, I mean there's been there's been lots of concerns expressed about um, about accessibility in the city center for bus users especially um, residents in the north and west north and west of Sheffield have been disproportionately um, affected as their inbound um, bus services travel near or along Kinston Street, allowing them to get off at, at the top of the hill. Um, but for a long time, services from the south and east of the city either terminated at the interchange or at Arundel Gate. Um, and prior to the Kinston Street changes, residents would have to catch their outbound services either from Kinston Street or go up to High Street or, or the Cathedral. So someone would be going uphill at some point. Um, and then following the changes, um, you know, a lot of these services, the bus stops are closer together, either 
um, both um, both on Arundel Gate, so inbound and outbound, or you know a little bit closer between Arundel Gate and, and the interchange. So that's some comments that residents have raised with myself, like for instance, 75 and 76, which serve um, serve a water now, like more um, you know closer together and more convenient for for people with accessibility issues or or otherwise. So my concern about whether regardless of whether or not Pinson Street is opened again or not, whether that there might be, that might precipitate changes which might, again, disadvantage uh, residents living in the south and or east of the, of, of the city, and whether there might be some, you know, some way to, um, you know, to mitigate that um, so that, you know, people aren't disadvantaged unduly. And, I mean, my view is, regardless of whether or not Pinson Street is open or not, the, you know, the priority has to be on getting that frequent, reliable city centre, um, you know, freebie, you know, circular bus, so that regardless if you're in the north, east, south or west, you can get off, you know, on, you know, Arundel Gate, Rockingham Street, you know, wherever, and get to where you need to get to without having to wait for half an hour or whatever, or walk uphill or downhill. Um, you know, as easily as possible. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for now. Thank you, James. Thank you. Somebody want to comment on this one? I've asked Peter to comment on, on the football and things, but let me just say, I mean, I, I think Richard makes some, some reasonable points there. Um, with with the, the freebie bus, I mean, again, I think it's something that we all agree would be of uh, benefit to the city um, and affecting big numbers of people and resolve you know, a lot of the issues that have been up for discussion today. And uh, again, it may be that you know, if the committee wants to recommend that does become a priority for, for the budget. It is an a implementable um, option, really. It, it can be done. Um, you know, we're currently waiting for a, a bid for government, but you know, we don't know, frankly, you know, when or whether that will turn out. So um, that would certainly be a, be a priority there. I suppose just my reflection on what you're saying is, uh, of course, that it reflects what Richard said earlier on. Um, you know, in other words, I don't want to be sitting here if we'd sort of moved all the buses around again and then we get the people from the other side of the city with them um, bringing exactly the same petitions as a mirror inverse, um, you know, complaining about that. But with all the additional disruption, uh, and, and we know that, you know, bus changes always cause disruption and you don't want to do them more often than, than you really need to. Do you want to ask on the other stuff? Um, uh, I'll try and be quick, Chair. So, in terms of the footfall figures, um, they are just straight counter information. Um, so, we don't have the demographic details or anything like that. And you also can't disaggregate between various different changes. So, they are just they are just the figures, Councillor Shaw. But uh, within the report, there's a there's a link to the Centre for Cities data, which they do the the modelling across all the different um, sort of urban areas. That might have some information which you can sort of take some questions from, which which you might have on there. Um, impact on Sheep Valley Cycle Route, yeah, uh, as Douglas said, it'll probably be, it's certainly a discussion with the city region, certainly, um, and then that would probably transfer to the DFT, and if not, the DFT would come to us to discuss it as well. Um, but yes, um, that would be something that we would need to consider um, as part of the point Council Lodge uh, made about the, the risk assessment. Um, and then the, the access point, I, I won't talk too much about that because I think we've, we've spoke about that issue already. Um, but what you have identified is, is one of the, the, co the, the co point about coherence I made. So you've, you've mentioned about the 75 and the 76 going to Woodseas. Well, previously, if you were in the town hall, as a user, you'd be given the choice whether you go to the bus stops on Pinson Street to catch the 75 and the 76, or you go down to Rundle Gate and you catch the 25, 24, except my expert knowledge of the bus network comes into play here. Um, but with it all being in one place, you don't have to make that choice. You know that if you go to that bus stop, you will get the next the next bus which takes you to your destination. So that was just a point of clarity. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jones. Is there is there a problem? Is there a problem? Sorry, yeah, we, we just um, mentioned the, the point that uh, Councillor Shaw made about reliability of the networks. And um, it seems to me that um, basically 
plus networks are running much more reliably now because they get through the centre much more quickly. Um, and that actually is important. Um, and it's just it's something that you know we've so much wanted to see for years, you know, buses running and not all bunching up. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if there's any more to say on that apart from just the fact that, yeah, I think we've all noticed it, really. Uh, Tom, you did. Well, I, th I think it's, it's worthwhile highlighting that, obviously, kind of we're, we're on this kind of transition in terms of recovery and traffic levels and other issues as well. And so, you know, you know a, a number of people have mentioned that, you know, traffic levels are lighter. Well, they are now becoming, you know, almost pre-pandemic levels. And on some routes, they are. And I think this is one of the things around the Transforming Cities scheme, kind of it's trying to lock in some of those benefits of, of journey time reliability through the city centre with those additional bus priority measures. So yes, we are seeing a, a much you know, quicker journey time through the city centre, reliability, but you know, should traffic increase again, then clearly the, the full scheme is there to, to lock those benefits in. I'll Thanks. just add, add slightly more. Just to, I mean, it is a really important issue, and this is not just a Sheffield thing, this is right across South Yorkshire. Um, we've got the bus service improvement plan coming up. Um, there's some really important discussions to have at the regional level about making the buses um, work. You know, because, as you know, you know, buses have been in decline for 10, 15 years, for longer than that. Um, in some parts of the country, the bus usage is rising. And... Frankly, you know, and I've put the question to people in the transport executive and the region, you know, why has our bus service been failing in Sheffield and South Yorkshire for so long um, when it's been, you know, there have been some pockets of the country where it's done well, you know. Is it lack of political will? And there is an element of that, frankly, and, and that's what the, those questions I keep wanting to raise. But speaking with the mayor recently, you know, we're all on the same page when it's actually we need to be serious about making buses well, work thank again you, Councillor Johnson. more recently. Uh, we're, we're moving on another subject here. Can we just but, get well, back it, to it? Sorry, it is a really yeah. important can, point. Uh, can it, I just... Yeah, yeah. Well, just made just your about point. The, the reliability. You have made, yeah. You've made your point. We need a reliable bus service that's on time. Thank you. Councillor Jones, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and sorry for disrupting the meeting in that way. The information given was quite helpful to some of the points I've got. Um, I'm kind of really mindful of unicorns and dragons here, uh, and there's a couple of unicorns that have been thrown out and a couple of dragons that need slaying, so please indulge me uh, while we work through this. Um, first and foremost, it, it, it's not about accessibility being degraded to the past unacceptable standard, uh, a bit like it used to be, uh, was, was the phrase used here. It's a case of, um, will the scheme deliver all it can be for all of our citizens? Um, because cause that's what we're here for. I said it at full council, I, I believe that everyone in this chamber uh, and in, in the wider uh, political circles here are in this for making the city better. So, so let's not um, mess around with, with playing politics on, on that. I, I think that we do need to do that. And, and picking up from Councillor Genzio, um, yeah, the city centre should have the feeling of a, of, of a village. Um, but I don't live in Paris. I don't want to live in Paris because um, Paris has a, a beautiful centre where you've got people that are disenfranchised living on the outskirts, and that's all riots, and, and that's not something I want to see here. So I want to see... I'm not French. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you are, uh, and that's disingenuous. What I'm saying is that we saw riots in Paris because those that have nothing are excluded from the city centre, and that's what we don't want to get here. So, so that's what we're aiming for here. We, we want a city that's inclusive for all of Sheffield. Um, and, and I know that officers have worked really, really well. And I'm really proud of the work that we've done for, for Greater Green. It is world recognised. As, as a former cabinet member, I received emails from students from around the world uh, picking up on that. And I'd love to see that extending into the city centre and into Burn Grieve, my ward. Um, but I do have to say that already I've, I, I've had some comments, and I've had them in the past, that um, if you get on the buses early in the morning, you'll see lots of cleaners coming in from Burn Grieve. Uh, to clean the city centre and then get back out again. So I need to know that the public transport systems work as best. Uh, I'd rather that my citizens weren't just coming in to clean the city centre and then to go home again because they can't afford to stay. Uh, and that's the, the, the paradigm that I want us to make sure we don't, don't get trapped in here, to, to be honest with you. Um, so, and, and, that, and that's where it came back to the winners and losers because we've heard that several times from several people. Um, Yes, there will always be losers, um, but we've got to try and minimize that. Um, and, and that's something that I really want to get done. 
One thing that would give clarity, uh, figure two, um, you, you referred to the orange bits on figure two as being service flays. Um, they're, they're I, I thought they were the cycle routes, but if they're service ways, then, then that's kind of quite helpful in terms of how we go forward on this one, because it kind of explains some of the elements of, of the maps and the, and the detailed routes that we've got in there. Uh, and coming back to some of the stuff that Councillor Lodge was saying, um, if we are going to get buses and, and vehicles for weddings to the town hall coming down Leopold uh, into Barker's Pool, um, it'd be really good to understand whether we would be looking at routing stuff around uh, Burgess Street and Cross Burgess and then back onto Finstone or whether we'd be looking to uh, exit them out onto Cambridge because uh, because those routes could still be quite beneficial in terms of having an electric bus which works across the city and around the city while also gaining access to this heart of the city um, because it is the heart of the city and and for me we've seen lots of people coming to the town hall and that really pleases, pleases me today because this isn't our town hall. It's not just the town hall for us political types uh, to swagger around and look self-important about. It's a town hall for the city. It's a town hall for our citizens. And I, I want to make sure that everyone can gain access to this as best we can. So um, if we can get uh, electric buses into the city centre that can bring people right to our doorstep and into our chamber, then that's beautiful. That's, that, that's what I think we'd all want to see. And I think that's what this entire report's about and what this session's about. Um, and the football bits, I kind of think that Sheffield has done the right thing in going for experiential, not just retail offers. I kind of suspect that's why other cities are struggling, because they've got more retail offers. Um, but I can't be sure about that. I can't qualify that. I, I just have a gut feeling on that one. Um, so um, more greater green, absolutely. Yes, please. Um, I do have some questions, and, and your points previously about the times. Um, We've seen the bus times uh, across the city, transit times, decreasing. Now, that will give an economic uplift and benefit to the bus companies. So, as part of their social value, social responsibility, um, maybe we could be looking to them to say that this is costing you a lot less money, so you don't have to operate quite as many buses, so you've got less drivers. Can you give us some back, please, to run and sit on an electric bus running around the city centre? Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily cost us money. Uh, and it won't necessarily cost them money because it will increase their network capacity and capability and hopefully sustainability. So I think that's part of what we've got in this report and, uh, and maybe that's part of what we're looking to kind of say to go back to the cabinet members and the cooperative, cooperative executive to rediscuss that. In terms of the orange routes on figure two um, for the service vehicles, currently um, it, it says in the report on point 1.1, uh, the Pinstone Street shut down all uh, except for emergency vehicles and permitted access, which includes obviously uh, construction vehicles at the moment. Um, but if those service routes um, in Orange are open through gated or otherwise means to buses, then that could mean they come straight past the town hall potentially. But alternately, if they can't do that, then maybe they could use that Burgess, Pat Burgess, uh, Pinstone route loop. Uh, maybe. It, it, it's, it's something I'd like to, to, to see if it's possible to consider uh, in, in terms of the measures that we've got here already. Um, one thing that I do want to emphasise there is, is we mentioned about the, the sustainability and the environmental elements of this. Um, what we wouldn't want to be doing is delivering a scheme right now um, which we would then have to do interventions and dig up later. Um, so the, I'm reassured that I, I'm, I'm, st I'm still smarting over the um, over the stuff on on uh, Gibraltar, uh, and, and I'm glad that we were able to rescue some of that. The, the low traffic neighbourhood in um, Kelham is, is great. Um, that's been achieved without the pure exclusion of traffic. Uh, but I don't want to confuse that here and conflate that here because not I don't think any of us are arguing for the inclusion of cars back into that area. We are we are looking for uh, clean transport, public transport, because. One of the things I am really mindful of, and, and this is a political lens, is we, we risk at the moment framing this as um, being green equates to anti-bus, uh, and that's not what we're doing, uh, because public transport uh, and buses, as part of that, it, it is very much part of the new cleaner, greener agenda that we all, we, we'd, all, we'd all sign up for, I think. Um, so, so there is that bit about that. Um, if bus, the, the question is, if those companies are showing... Um, beneficial gain from economic uh, 
uh, elements of being able to get through the city centre better, can we have some of that back and can we ask that question of them? Uh, that would be really, really helpful. Um, um, within the report we've got here, it does say bus improvements will follow. Um, I kind of think that bus improvements probably will follow. We've already seen some of that. Um, it, it would be better to have that kind of hardened up. Um, one dragon that I would like to slay here and now is, um, would a bus on Pinstone Street be directly down Pinstone or partially down Pinstone, would that preclude or exclude um, Pocket Pound Park? Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that it would specifically, uh, per se, and, and at the moment, it, the argument's being breached that if we put a bus down and let cars back in, we can't have Pocket Pound. Um, again, I, I want to address that because that's not what we're suggesting here. It, it, it's, it's a compromise, a fudge system, but as democracy is, it's all about fudging. Um, one of the other things that I would like to bring is, is uh, in section 2.2, um, it talks about walking and cycling only. Um, again, there, there must be, it's, it's not beyond our, our, our experience and capability to include public transport with walking and cycling. I don't want the city centre to be a place for young people and fit people only. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it, maybe I'm selfish as an old grey man, um, but I, I kind of think that's something that I want to make sure that we can address through this. And, and, and part of the report does, does kind of scare that way. Um, and um, yeah, I, I've kind of covered loads of things, um, but there is something about 3.8, and it goes back to the bus bit that I've raised as well. 3.8 within this report is, is, is aspirational to bring in the bus back. So, can you give us more feeling that 3.8 isn't just aspirational of bringing the bus back? That, that with the stuff that I've suggested, that may give in economic benefits and other elements, that we can get an electric bus in. Because that, if we can do that, I, I think everyone's going to be a lot happier with the heart of the city. Um, so I'm hoping that you can dig out the questions where possible and, and take on part the, the comments uh, as, a, as appropriate. Sorry for rambling. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, I just say, I mean, I, I think it's very welcome to hear there's lots of positive stuff in there and lots lot of good agree with. And I, sort of the other thing I can say, I'd suggest that we, you yeah, know, definitely take away the ideas we're saying about the just take Cambridge Street and so on and so on. But certainly getting the freebie bus, I mean, that is, you know, within our gift um, to implement and say, if we can identify the, the, the funds and do that, we could, you know, if it's a priority for us, we could make a decision to, to do that in advance of government funding coming in. And I think we, we're all saying we'd like to see that. Um, but I think your, your sensible point was about, you know, was referring back to, you know, the, the shale small scheme that was, you know, put in and then taken out. So if we're going to the rights and wrongs of that, you know, we, we all lost credit for being seen to put in something that had recently taken out. And that's why I'm, I'm suggesting it's actually better for all of us if we just keep steadily on with progressive schemes that go in the same direction rather than going a bit forward and a bit backwards. You know, that's what I'm saying. The, the next step, you know, and given that, as emphasising earlier on, we've had a whole sequence of decisions over the last two years, uh, both about this city centre scheme, but also all the other uh, trans connecting Sheffield schemes that link up to it, the integral parts, they work together. Um, we need to keep on in that direction so that we don't, you know, get criticised for just taking out what we've put in. So, yeah, I mean, that, that sounds really sensible, and I think we're definitely on the same page. Thank so I'm wrapping on, and probably yeah, you'll Councillor, want to hear from Matt. Can we just hear from Matt quickly? please, because we've got, still got lots of questions. Thanks, Councillor Fox. Yeah, so um, just quickly then, Councillor Jones, in terms of the service routes, it's, it's not all of the orange routes, it's, it's the bits on the plan between Cross Burger Street and Surrey Street, so the bit around the Peace Gardens, they'll be the bits for servicing, because, well, quite frankly, you don't need to use servicing for the other bits, it's just that bit which needs to be done. If you look a bit closer, you can see there's active loading bays on the plan as well. Uh, the way that would be managed is, is very similar to how uh, Fargate is managed at the moment. So it would be servicing between these times outside of sort of core pedestrian usage. Uh, but if access is required, then it, uh, the idea is, is that it will follow an approach that they do in Leeds City Centre, where there's a rise in bollard which goes up and down. So should emergency access be needed? Should, I don't know, say a delivery of, of something needs to go into that area, then it's controlled through the, through the City Centre management team and that would be sort of worked through. Um, the, whether a bus can go through there is, a, is more of a question of practicality. 
because that rising bollard would be up and down all of the time and that gives um, a different element of the space to be used particularly if it's been used for chair and table tables and stuff like that but that's a matter of detail we can get through through the next stage I'll touch on your problem uh, in, into uh, your question around um, the zebra funding the zero emission bus funding um, Tom mentioned yeah it's gone through expression of interest through the DFT it's now with the uh, SYP team for development into a full business case so if anyone doesn't understand project speak that is the last stage before you get approval so it's positive time scales incredibly tight so obviously that's why we need to get an understanding about what this is because this is where the cascading impact on a decision here on this scheme has, has quite big implications and everything else um, in terms of the uh, the saved well the savings to bus operators we call that saved resource in the Sheffield bus partnership there is a commitment from the bus operators that if that happens it is reinvested back into the network um, I so in extra routes extra services whatever that might be and that's a discussion which we would have as a local authority through Sheffield City Region SYP team with the bus operators so that is that is one way in which we can start to harness some of that some of that benefit and it doesn't just get slipped away into or into the bus operators budgets basically um, in terms of routing for pounds park yeah I mean this is something again it's just a matter of detail I'm sorry Mark at this point in time sorry Councillor Jones um, at this point in time we can't um, give certainty as to what that route is until we know what the costs are and everything else but it's something which we can certainly look into um, and then the other bit around accessibility I think that's been picked up through the shop mobility um, discussions we had before okay thank, thank you, you. Thank you. I, uh, I'm open to finish by half past four, councillors, because I think we've sat here long enough. It will be three and a half hours. Uh, so can you be quick uh, and succinct with your answers, please? And try not to repeat yourself because we've heard it. Thank you, councillor. Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm sitting here listening to the debate and listening to the answers. And I very much don't feel that... Um, even though people might be listening, I don't think the points are being heard. Um, I, I don't see how we can close Princeton Street for one purpose and then keep it closed for another. Um, it's, we're conflating lots of initiatives here with very, very little solid planning behind them to actually say, right, we're going to do this. We've we've put a bid in here, we've put that bid in there, and we're thinking about this and we're thinking about that. We haven't got, you know, if, if we go back to the people in, in, in our constituents and say, well, yes, you made the point that you can't get to where you go, go to in, in the city centre anymore now, so you don't go to the city centre, um, and we put that point to the committee, and they decided that, it, you know, it, it didn't matter. I don't think the consultation um, that, that was done through November and December last year against the ri uh, rising backdrop of, of, of increased um, shutdowns measures leading to a, a full lockdown in December and uh, rising COVID cases, which would necessarily preclude face-to-face -face meetings. I don't think you would have talked to a very representative range of people in Sheffield. You talk to a thousand people or you heard from a thousand people in Sheffield, but I bet most of those were nine. And I would like to see that a wider consultation process an engagement process taking, uh, taking place, which would influence the design of routes through the city centre, especially around the buses, because um, the people that we're talking about I mean, we, it, it seems to be we have this ambition to create a gated community in the city centre for the benefit of 20,000 people. Well, the rest of the 530,000 people that live in Sheffield, a lot of those use buses a lot of the time. In Sheffield, in the 70s, we had the lowest car ownership in the country, and that's because we had a good bus service that went to where people wanted to go and was affordable. We don't have that now since the deregulation. But these people that have spoken to me, actually I've had two emails um, in favour of the proposals, and please don't reopen Pinston Street. 
um, on one against, but also, um, and that's excluding the, the petition that we got, um, but also some face-to-face -face conversations and some telephone calls by people that live in my ward. And they are saying, they were the, they were the original people who used buses in Sheffield in the 70s. They worked in the steelworks, they worked in the mines. Some of them may be elderly and frail and arthritic now. Some of them may have got COPD, or as they phrase it, I've got dust on my lungs. And some of them may have heart disease. But if we don't consider clean, safe routes through the city for them to get into the city centre and meet up with their friends at Victoria Hall for a coffee or go to the theatre or access the bank or go to the market, then we are failing a wide proportion of our city. The residents that live here, that have devoted their lives to the city, who've worked here, who've contributed to the, to the well-being of the city, we can't afford to let that happen because they are residents too and they should have their say. Um, it, it, you know, if we carry on with the plans to... I, I looked at the figures, and I, I, I do appreciate that you've used a formula to work out, to take into account gradient as, well, as well as distance, but I can't work out where those are coming from because there's nowhere that says um, this is zero, this is a zero point, so walking from here to here, it's so many metres longer. Um, it, that, that was a bit confusing. I, I, I know that there's something behind it, but I, I, I can't understand that, and I can't communicate that to people in, in my community. But what I do know is that if we don't consider this as a whole and talk to people more widely and present them with a plan that they can sign up to from the benefit of knowledge and information, that we failed them, um, that we've taken away their choice for social events or shopping or just getting out of the house and seeing another person and having that conversation. And we've reduced their quality of life and we've had a massive impact, which is what we're trying not to do. We're trying to improve the quality of life for everybody in Sheffield for longer, not for some of us, for some of the time. Oh dear. <laughs> I did. I didn't want to to um, to astound anybody by to, to that extent. Um, there was only really one question about the gradients, weren't there? In that? It was, so, there was, yes. Well, it was a question about how you'd worked the gradients, gradients out, out. And, yeah. a, and a request for more um, I think consultation. Can that answer that, please? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So um, it is quite a complicated process, and I didn't want to put it into this report because. Obviously, it'll just it'll confuse people. But I'm more than happy to send it to you outside of the meeting. Um, essentially, it's been taken on each bus route and then to each distance, and then you, it all works out. But I can share that to you and then give me a call and I can talk you through. That's absolutely not a problem. Yeah. Just, just on the consultation, um, the, the, the very brief point is that, um, I mean, plenty of consultation was done with lots of responses. And I think, you know, we've, we all know what the, you know, the main things coming back there, you know. The valid points about you know, accessibility, um, you know, the impact on businesses, etc. So it's very much that they aren't taken account of. Um, you know, I don't think there would be if you get to be more consultation, you get more response to saying the same thing. But it's unlikely you gain anything, any new information. Um, so, so that's just where we are. It is there, and the, the challenge now is to work out how best to come up with a design that you know, improves accessibility and improves all the bus stops um, and all the things that were in the plan there, you know, but at the same time, you know, improves the opportunities for walking and cycling. I mean, you can get an awful lot of those improvements in if we go ahead, which is simply you're going to have to abandon if you want to reverse the scheme. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. I think the point she made was that we haven't consulted some of the people, not... But I think the point yeah. is that we, we have consulted all the people in the sense that it was all public consultation. The outreach. Yeah. The no, outreach. Maybe that some people didn't, didn't respond, but maybe some yeah. people didn't know that. It's true. Thank you. Councillor Auckland, it's your turn. Mm. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Firstly, I'd just like to say I have budget on my list of points to raise. I would support the recommendation from the committee that we ask 
the cabinet member for transport, and the uh, sorry, executive member for transport, and the executive member for finance, uh, to take the provision of an, uh, an electric freebie bus in the city centre as a budget given. I felt pretty confident about this on Tuesday, and then I read the star headlines this morning, but I guess I'm in the mind of thinking that if, uh, you know, if you owe the bank manager £44 million, the bank's got a problem, and if you owe them £4 million, it's your problem. So I would suppose uh, a, a, an additional recommendation that we, that we find the money one way or another. We've talked about it a long way. I hope that will be seconded. And if the government gives us the money, that would be, that would be great, Chair. Um, very minor point, but, uh, and I wonder whether to declare an interest, but I'm not planning to get remarried, so I don't think it's a, beyond a, a personal interest. But the wedding bus, I know the people who drive the wedding bus very often, and uh, they'd like provision to be made for them to get in and out of the uh, city city centre with their vintage bus when people are using the facilities. Uh, I just want to echo uh, my uh, point on reinvestment. And 2.9 in the report makes the point about the bus agreement. Not a fan of the bus agreement, as you know. And also, I think they've welched on the uh, possibility of, I think one of the problems was the reinvestment issue. So uh, please, hold the bus companies to the, whatever the benefits, hold them to their reinvestment promises, and if they don't do it, give notice on the bus agreement and withdraw from it, please. Um, I'm just concerned about fund independency, which I know you've tried to answer, and you say there is a risk, but what does the agreement with the Department for Transport say exactly? And it's a separate scheme and I don't see it. I'm really struggling to see that there is necessarily a dependence and, there a, and therefore a risk. But also, I've had a look today. If you walk outside of here and look at the bus stops uh, on Pinston Street, it tells the Sheffield public that the bus services have been suspended for social distancing, not for permanent pedestrianisation, not, 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 not forever not for part of a plan to pedestrianise Pinston Street. So I just wonder, have, there been, have we misled the public on that point? Have we, because it suggested it, it, it was for a specific purpose. What did the bus companies say uh, and the PTE say when you originally proposed closing Pinston Street? And what do they now say? I mean, has their opinion changed from being dead dead against it, because I think uh, that, that would be interesting. As many other members in the room have commented, some people, I think, in the emails that I've received and the questions that I've received and I've heard today, uh, have set up something about you want to reintroduce motorised traffic onto Pinston Street. I don't think, I don't think I, I do. I possibly actually don't necessarily want to see a, a bus. A, well, I certainly want to see a bus service on Pinston Street as soon as now, straight away. I would never have removed the bus services from Pinston Street unless I had absolutely no choice. But if somebody's got a better plan that's, that eventually serves bus users better than the existing arrange, than the arrangement that, that, that existed before, I'd, I'd be prepared to, to, to look at it. I'm sure we, we, we all would. But we're talking about the specific circumstances of what we said to the public and what's happened. I, I agree totally with the many members who have commented that we haven't actually asked the people who are most affected, which are the bus users. And the, a bus is the most likely way of getting people out of cars. They might prefer a tram, but that's very expensive, so a bus is the most likely way of getting people out of cars. A bus is the most likely alternative if we have to encourage, by various means, which a lot of people won't like, to get out of the cars and get on the bus. And because I'm very COVID um, uh, cautious still, I'd include, I'd include me, me that in, in, in that. To some extent, I'm, I'm relying on bus users to help get us out of the, 
the mess that we're in. And, and, and yeah, a bus is a very inclusive way of getting, of getting around. So, so let's, let's commit to, to an alternative and let's have a bus on Pinston Street. One of the things I don't understand is, is, is why seemingly some people are against the service on Pinston Street, yet we still have massive uh, dislocation, really, across Mullerhead on, uh, on Furnival Gate around Ch Charter Road. Now, I know in the plans that there are some, some ideas, bus gates on Arundel Gate, things like that. But surely that's a bigger problem that, 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 that you're not addressing than an electric bus service uh, that's going to that's going to help people inclusively get around get around the city. Uh, I have a bit of a, a bugbear because I've said nobody's suggesting putting motorised traffic back onto uh, Pinston Street as a whole, um, and it's this. I, I've never quite got my head round. A pedestrian area should be, people, should be for people on foot. The only people who should need, need wheels in a pedestrian area are people who can't get around and mark one's feet. And so a lot of, a lot of traffic on wheels is motorised. Electric bikes, scooters, skateboards, even bikes are powered by a, a person. And I, I, just, I just don't... I just don't see pedestrianisation. We should aim to make that pedestrianised access almost ex almost ex exclusively. But we still allow for um, we still allow for authorised vehicles. So even though we have a pedestrian area out on Fargate, there's access at certain times. So you could you could easily condition. Uh, uh, Pinston Street to be just authorised vehicles only. You just authorise buses, yeah, or possibly taxis if there were hydrogen powered and that sort of thing. But surely that's that, that's what that's what you, what you would do. When we looked at, uh, at at Pinston Street for social distancing, I, I just I just wonder whether we looked at Union Street and Charles Street because. In the end, this mainly used for very few of us to get to get to Howden House and Derwin House. And there's a lot of space there which which could be used, you know, disabled parking spaces, you'd lose some paid for spaces. Footfall, you'd get people through, you'd still get people to mow ahead and they still have to get across the mow. So I'm rambling on chair and you want it to finish, but it comes down to this. Why did we decide that social distancing meant excluding buses from Pinston Street? I, d I don't see that we ever had to do it. And now that we have done it, I can't see why we can't find a way back, which seems to be a consensus view uh, here for public transport. Thank you. Matt, do you want to go up, Tom? Yep. Uh, thanks for those questions. Um, I'll, I'll try and do them in a bit of a reverse order and then Matt might come in, I think. So, at Union Street, you know, the, as an alternative for social distancing routes. So, um, Pinston Street has the highest demand for, for, for walking from the, the top of the town hall, Fargate, through to the moor. It's the most direct route. It is um, the highest demand. It's on that desire line. And, and, and that's why um, it, it was chosen that we needed to provide space along Pinston Street for that use, trying to get pedestrians to kind of divert from a desire line is extremely difficult. You, you'll see it when footways go in across verges and they're not on the right route. You'll see those tracks in, in the grass where actually people want to go. If we um, put a sign up and said, please use Union Street, you can bet your bottom dollar that people wouldn't. And that's why we, we, we decided that it was the right thing to accommodate it where people were wanting to go. Um, and um, so you can also see that when um, one-way systems are, are footways, you know, they, 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 through social distancing, some places put up uh, one-way systems on footways. And again, people just didn't kind of adhere to that. Um, uh, pedestrianisation, um, 
pedestrianisation uh, allowing uh, cyclists is not pure pedestrianisation. It's, it's the design of a street to allow space for pedestrians and dedicated space uh, for cyclists. Um, that's, that's, that's the proposal for the Transforming City Scheme. Um, and allowing vehicles into a pedestrian space would have to be designed appropriately. Um, we, I think the government have been clear previously in terms of the design of projects that shared space where vehicles are coming through effectively pedestrianised uh, level surfaces is not something that we should be uh, promoting or doing. Um, and they've put a stop on, on those schemes uh, being implemented. Um, so you have to provide the right levels of space. And some of the mobility issues we've discussed today are exactly for some of those reasons. Um, in terms of the dislocation across Moorhead, I might need you to come back on that one. But uh, Matt, do you want to come in terms of the consultation with the PTE? Yeah, so uh, Council Alton, yeah, you, you, you're right. We, we've been speaking to the PT and bus operators about this. Um, I think it's, it's obviously quite clear to say that bus operators would like to continue to serve Pinson Street. Um, however, on the back of that, they also value the, the, the economic benefit which could derive from this project for a, a strong, thriving city centre, which they, they acknowledge as well. The other side of that is that with the, you know, with the introduction of the bus gates, that's where they see the biggest importance to the project because that's what locks in that public transport journey time improvement. They like the idea of the consistent approach to the interchange like what we've expressed before um, and the PTE sort of follow that position as well. If you asked the PTE about this project and you were to say which bits would you like, they would say absolutely lock in that public transport priority uh, through the bus gates. We have a good working relationship with the PTE clearly and with the bus operators as well. So it's always um, out in the open and we, we do have those robust discussions. Uh, I recall a, a, a previous uh, scrutiny committee, um, I can't remember when it was now, probably December time, uh, where the bus operators came in and we had uh, a pretty much the same discussion that their position is, is pretty much as it was uh, back with that, uh, that, that previous scrutiny board. Probably fair to say, I mean, given that, you know, that this whole issue has been discussed in scrutiny before and no one had a proposal then to take out all the active travel. Um, but also, the, the, the scheme that's proposed, you know, is really about supporting public transport, you know. It, it is already moving through the city much faster. It's serving more places. And if you, if you want to undo that, then, you know, you're going to set buses back. So, you know, great if you hate buses. <laughs> But, I mean, you know, we all say that we want to support buses, and that's why we should do that. And this is also a chance to put in all that new infrastructure we mentioned earlier on, you know, stops and seating and so on. Um, it's just that, that is really important. We have to acknowledge that, you know, we actually talk about, um, you know, reallocation of road space here, and it's about making this whole scheme work as a coherent whole, um, and that's simply why you can't just put buses back on like that. You know, there will be very significant losses to that, you know, including to all the bus improvements. You know, there, there's a risk we will just throw a lot of stuff away there. That's all. Thank you. I know there was some more indicated that we want to speak, but is it going to be really quick, Councillor Rooney? Quick, quick, quick. Thank you, Chair. Um, I may have misunderstood the situation. The introduction of a bus, or whatever type it might be, onto Pinston Street, does that put the funding that you are talking about at risk? Because I'm unclear about that. So the, the scheme that has been developed does not accommodate a bus from uh, going, it, it doesn't accommodate buses traveling past the town hall, past the peace gardens, to cross Burgett Street. The design of that space doesn't accommodate a bus. Um, if if that, that scheme does not progress and buses are reintroduced onto Pinston Street, we would have to redesign that scheme. We would have to kind of look at that again. Um, we, we would have to consider all of the implications of that, including the risks around the funding, both discussions with the funders, from their objectives, 
from a practical perspective in terms of the time it would take us to develop an alternative scheme within those program periods for delivery. And, and we, we know that those were already tight in terms of the delivery window and we would, we would not be able to meet those delivery uh, timescales at the moment with, for the current scheme. Again, that's a discussion that we would have to have with the funder, um, both from a delivery perspective, value for money perspective, and whether it met the objectives of the fund. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll give some recommendations now. Yeah. I did Councilor say, I did, thank you. Uh, I, I did ask them today, I've got a comment to make. I'll, I'll not ask the other questions, I've got a comment, but it's not requiring answers to these things. But I think it, it, it's, it's worthy of pointing out that things that, one of the things that the Labour government introduced was the National Concessionary Travel Scheme, which brought about the free bus passes because they recognised in getting, getting people travelling, whether they're pensioners or they've got uh, mobility issues, there are various different ones in there with the National Concession Travel Scheme. And it's one of the things I'm really proud about that they introduced because it gets people out, it gets people moving. And that's great, unless you want to get into the heart of the Sheffield City Centre when Councillor Johnson in the start on the 14th of August said, if you want to get from A to B, you need a taxi. So we've got free bus passes, unless you want to get into the heart of the city, which is becoming a large pedestrianised area, then you need to get a taxi and it's no longer free for you. It seemed to come across in some of the comments that it's more an issue of it's active travel or public transport on top, you know, going down Pinson Street. Pinson Street was wide enough for traffic going both directions years ago. It's been wide enough for buses going down as well as uh, having a lane for traffic moving down and through. And, and I'm sure it must be wide enough to get a lane down there that an electric bus could go down while still introducing cycle measures and improved pedestrian access down that road that allows people to get through into the city centre where they want to be. Uh, footfall is increasing in the city centre, but at the time that the consultation was undertaken, people were not travelling on buses. There were very few people travelling on buses, and so they didn't understand, possibly, the full impact of what it meant if they were moving the buses and they had to travel to get in that wider pedestrianised area. I think there's further proposals within the Connecting Sheffield that introduce pedestrianisation on Surrey Street, which makes it an even bigger area, which, you know, you start looking and thinking, well, what's that mean? How's the Lord Mayor getting to the town hall now? She has to use the current Lord Mayor, future Lord Mayors be even further away, having to use the back door and not using the front door of the town hall. We've got weddings that use the wedding rooms that are there. It's a prestigious venue that people want to come and go there. And then you see brides that having to be rushed across the, ski, the, the street to get there, uh, puddles around when it's raining and lifted and carried in recent weeks to get through there. And, um, you know, if the Queen wanted to come again in a few years, are we expecting her to get off and, and hoof it up from Arundel Gate or from the top of uh, the other road and come through? Because we've now closed it off and made it pedestrianised. If it's not good enough for the citizens of Sheffield, you know what, well, then why should anybody else have access to get there? We've done pedestrianisation of the Moor and Fargate, very, very successful. And I wouldn't say don't do pedestrianisation. The difference there is, and it was, it was hinted at with, with Councillor Auckland, with there are spinal routes that go through and link through. So crossing, crossing the top of the moor to the bottom of Pinson Street, you've got the route that goes through and bus stops. What's different to that with buses coming down Pinson Street? Electric buses. Nobody is suggesting we go for a full, all the buses back on Pinson Street. Nobody is suggesting we put polluting vehicles on there. We're talking about ultra-low emission vehicles, electric buses, hydrogen buses, no emissions coming out. The, the, the air quality has improved in that area. Has it improved to such an extent because we're no longer putting buses there? And if you're not putting buses back on there, does it mean that we don't need the clean air zone in the city centre? Because we, we're told that polluting buses going through the city centre is causing the problem. So I think we need to look at that. Uh, I think the, all the information about bus stops and improving bus stops and connectivity and interchange facilities and, and real time. Have you, Fantastic, and we want more of that, but we've got to encourage people to use the public transport, and if we're not putting the buses where people want to go, why are they going to use public transport? Uh, I think the, the, there was a comment about, and, and I asked the question, it's been asked again about if funding is impacted and talking about whether the, the city region 
would support this. The city region have supported the redevelopment of Barnsley Town Centre, which includes measures for public, uh, for private vehicles, not just public transport going through. And the city region have funded some of those things through there. Uh, it does feel a little bit uneasy talking comments about winners and losers when we're talking about people who've got problems getting around and, and I class myself in that because, you know, I find it difficult, as I said at the start, walking up and walking up that way, coming through to get up here to the town hall. Winners and losers, we, should, we want winners for it, we want winners. We don't want losers, we want winners. And there's got to be a way that we can get an electric bus that comes through that city centre that makes it possible for people to come through. And there, surely there is enough space out there that we can redesign the scheme. Uh, it, it was unfortunate, again, Councillor, Councillor Johnson, you made comments about a motorist rob lobby uh, and the motorist lobbying for things. We've not had one, I've not had, and I've not heard anybody or anybody in here today making a single comment from the motorist lobby. Nobody is lobbying to get private vehicles on there. We have had lobbyists from Cycle Sheffield and from Sustrans and, and the cycle lobbies and things like that, but we haven't had anything from the motorists. So please try not to, uh, to isolate and pick people out there uh, and, and make it out that it's something that it's not. I think what I would like to do, Chair, is uh, with the recommendation, I'd like to, with the recommendation, strengthen it, that the, that the leader looks back at this, that the, the leader takes it back to the cooperative, sorry, that goes back to the cooperative executive, which is what the leader's asking, uh, based on the issues that we've raised in here today about accessibility, about inclusiv inclusivity, about uh, travel through the city centre for people getting through, about looking at whether an electric vehicle, and I'm, and I'm, so, I'm not saying all 39 services go back on there or however many it was, but it wouldn't hurt to have a number of buses going through there each hour that allow people to get through. And so to look at those sort of issues that we've got in there to, to enhance the recommendation that's taken back, giving the reasons and the views that have been expressed by people in here today, that goes back to the co-op executive for a discussion and a decision. Thank you, Councillor Lodge. Councillor Phillips. Thanks, this will be very quick. Um, I just wondered, have public health been consulted around the review of Pinston Street? And if so, what was their feedback? Um, I can check that for you, Councillor Phipps. And I'll come back to you. Thank you. Could you circulate that to all the uh, members, please? Thank you. Sorry, Chair, just a brief response to Councillor Lodge. Um, just on the on the, the taxi. No, I don't. No, we we're not we're not we've gone off. Yeah. We've, okay. We've moved off questions now. We are Councillor Shaw. Thank, thank you, Chair. It's just a, a very brief um, comment. I mean, there's been um, uh, some. I don't want to say like stereotyping, but in some of the discussion around this, it's it's like complacency. It's like walking and cycling with being, having to be like young and fit and excluded. Um, in 2019, the council passed a motion recognizing that um, older people and people with disabilities um, can and do, well, some people with, you know, um, can and do uh, cycle and, and indeed recognized cycles as mobility aids and asked for improvements to um, infrastructure and things like parking and things, particularly around public buildings to accommodate people with, um, who need like adapted or you know, use standard um, cycles or hand cycles or other mobility aids and mobility scooters and things. So um, it's just a word of caution about kind of fall, falling into the you know, life of clad cyclist stereotype when indeed you know, some of the older members of this council also uh, cycle. Uh, but thank you, thank Councillor you, Shaw. Do we have any other recommendations on the floor? Councillor Auckland? Yes, Chair, the point about, uh, I, would, I would suppose it being factored into the budget as a, as a, commi as a commit, recommended that it, I know we can't make spending decision yet, but recommended to the, uh, to the executive and the cabinet member for transport and finance that, that they take a commitment to the electric freebie bus uh, as, a, as a, a budget given. 
I don't know if we can do that yet. I think I'm, I'm not sure we can make a commitment on a budget going through to put uh, something to, into a budget. To, to be clear, I, kn I know we can't make a commitment. I'm not suggesting that we can um, and that we change the budget. recommend to look at. Yeah, that recommend to look at that as a commitment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we've got... Which, Councillor Lodge, would you like that to Within the Constitution. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that, Chair. It, it was just, I, I was just a bit concerned that it sounded like we were making a commitment and tying the hands of, of the Cabinet member, or sorry, the Cooperative Executive Member for Finance as well as for, for Transport to turn around and say, we've got to find that funding, you know, because if we find it from somewhere, it means something else has to drop off, so... It's, it swings and roundabouts in that respect, isn't it? and it's what the impact on something else is. So. With a recommendation, that's fine. Councillor Phipps, have you got a recommendation? Yeah, would members support looking into, I know the shop mobility scheme has been mentioned several times, would members support a recommendation around reviewing this, what was lost, what's being offered on the new scheme, and seeing if that fills the gaps or moving forward on that maybe something more will be needed than the current proposed scheme to make up that gap councillor hurst um thank you chair i think the problem with it, we're looking at independent travel here and shop mobility um was a good scheme but again um was not somebody being able to get up in the morning and make a decision to go down town that day it was a pre-bookable scheme. So I think um, in, in the light of this motion, I, I, I don't think it's, it, it gels as, as, as well as the recommendation to consider the, the 3D electric bus. Chair, Ch I don't know if... Yeah, Councillor Lodge. I don't, the shop, yeah, I don't think you do the shop, you do a sort of shopability scheme I think to that extent, I'd say I'd be in favour of looking at it. I wouldn't do it the way it was, pre-booked, static sort of thing. You would look, you would look at how you could make it genuinely, more easily um, flexible, accessible to to public, to the public who need a bit more help to get around the the, the, the centre. Um, I, I was thinking. You might make it an app-based thing, but then you're into, well, not everybody's got an app-based uh, thing, that, so that you'll, but some way of making it a responsive on-demand uh, system. Because that's, that's the point. I do, I do agree with what Councillor Hurst is saying, that you, you wouldn't really reinvent shopability as it, exactly as it was, I don't think, shop mobility. I think we're looking at what the... <laughs> It, we were asked to look at Pinstone Street and the changes made to Pinstone Street. We're now moving into other realms now, aren't we? I think that we need to, to, to just stick to what we've been asked to look at today. So we've got a recommendation on the floor. Chair, Chair, if I may, there was one thing I, I did miss on. I, I just wanted to thank, but can we, can we thank the officers for the work they put in here in the presentation? They've had, they've had pretty much of a grilling this afternoon, but I think we should recognise that they're being open and honest with the answers and coming through. And, and, you know, for all of us in here for so long, uh, and that's helped us to arrive at a decision and a recommendation. Absolutely, yes. We do want to make sure that's no, minuted. Thank you very much for your answers and uh, your time today. It's been a long day. So, the recommendation, as I see it, is that we ask the cooperative executive to re-look at looking at electric buses uh, going through Pinston Street, uh, Leopold Street. Is that, is that what you said? Yeah? Pretty much as a summary, Chair, yeah, based on the reasons that we've given, that we've outlined in here, but I can let, I can let the committee yeah, secretary have that information. if you want to... Uh, Send your word in. Okay, so do we have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Jones. Shall we, do we need to vote on this? Councillor Shaw, you hesitant? Oh, sorry, I, I understood that the recommendation originally was that there needed to be a electric or low emission service. It wasn't prescriptive about the exact route. 
um, as you know, Councillor Jones has already talked about. You know, it could go you know around uh, what is it, Cambridge Street, Lower Burgess, or whatever. So we need a you know we need a service that you know goes around the city centre and provides that connectivity. Um, I'm hesitant about it being exactly prescriptive about exactly which route um, until it's been looked at by um, you know, the executive or whatever and looked into further. If it helps, Chair, I was saying that the executive can look co the cooperative executive look at this with a view to open the, opening that route for electric vehicles. I didn't prescribe a route, but, but for use by electric vehicles, low emission vehicles, whether that's ultra low emission buses, not for taxis or permitted vehicles, but just so there are some buses that are going through down there. Okay. Are we happy? Are we happy with this recommendation now? Does anybody else want to add or, or detract anything? Have you included a budget, Vicky? <laughs> no. All right, go on. So can we all uh, vote on this on Councillor Lodge's recommendation? All those in favour? All those against? Two. So that has, that's been carried. Thank you. Any abstentions? Yes? One abstention. Okay, so it has been carried. So, thank you very much um, for your attendance today. I do believe the next item is our work programme, but you can leave. You, you're welcome to leave. Do we have... Uh, Chair, yeah, did you include the recommendation? Did we vote on my proposal that it was recommended that it, put, it was put in the budget? It was included. I should have seconded you then, Brian, and should have taken them. Okay, councillors, um, just before we close, we need to uh, look at the work programme. Is there anything, any burning issues that you need, you want me to uh, ask officers to look into? <laughs> is it, nobody no okay well we'll um, we'll have a discussion and come up with a another agenda for next time unless you think of something we've got equalities annual report for the next um, meeting councillors on the 4th of November day before bonfire so Thank you very much for your attendance and I'll close the meeting now.